John Gray, here we are in person, man. Great to see you again. Good to see you again. I'm so excited we're able to sit down. The first two times we recorded, as you know, and the audience probably doesn't know, we were on Skype, which is how a lot of podcasters do shows. So when I started out in the beginning, that's how I did them when people lived far away. Or if I couldn't coerce someone to fly into Los Angeles or something. So I was super stoked that you were going to be here at the Health Optimization Summit and that I might just have a chance of sitting down. So I'm really excited. I want to start out with a conversation you and I had one of the times we recorded before. And we talked about your journey in early spiritual seeking and um, your time getting into meditation and all of this. And then you told me some really amazing stories and we had a really great talk for about 20 minutes. And then I clicked record and we went into the real show. And so I, <laughs> I thought that that part of the conversation was so interesting to me. And I always wish, damn, I wish I had recorded that. And now I'm going to get my chance. So um, back in the early days, you hung out with uh, the Maharishi and were his sort of assistant, sidekick for a number of years. And I don't know if you remember, but I've always been fascinated with the Indian saints and sages, gurus, etc. Even went over there chasing a couple of them down at one point. And so take us back to how you ended up having that experience and getting to know him and being so close to uh, what many consider to be an enlightened master. Yeah, he's a great guy. Um, so I'm in my teenage years. I'm very entrepreneurial then. I had my own paper route. I worked in a equivalent of a jack it's called jack in the box i was a cook you know <laughs> before that i took martial arts i was like on the front of a martial arts magazine i really get into things i'm very devoted and uh uh i really like learning and all that so i was busy as a kid i focused on being very self very independent learning these things and uh the beatles were talking about getting high without drugs and everybody's getting high with drugs. And I went to the Texas Woodstock. It was happening about the same time as Woodstock with all the bands. It was three days. I was high the whole time. And Come Down was huge. I had a little white Volkswagen bug. And I drove back from... Naturally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and my <laughs> friends drove me back home. It was in another city. And I was in the back little compartment, like in the womb. And I, there, you know, there was uh, the song, uh, Can't Find My Way Home. And we played it over and over. It was such a, I just felt so lost after that. And I said, I have to find something. And then uh, the, I heard the Moody Blues album, that song Om, it, which is a fantastic song. And I just got, I, my consciousness just went up. And then my mother walked into the room and her consciousness went up. She went, wow, what's this music? You know, she was so excited about it. And then, then she pointed out I had a poster in my room with the Beatles and Maharishi. And she says, who's that man? And I said, I don't know. And she said, that's very interesting. So a week later, I'm at the bowling alley. And somebody says to me, hey, there's a samurai warrior demonstration. And I was into martial arts. So I went, cool. And I went up. And it wasn't a samurai. It was a seminar oh. on transcendental meditation. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. So I went to that. I'm mean, 17 years old at that point. And the guy gave his talk. I learned meditation. But I came home two hours late. And my dad said, where you been? He thought I was out. And I said, no, I went to this talk on meditation. He didn't believe me. He said, well, tell me what you learned. And I gave the whole talk. I mean, it was like written in my heart. It was like, it was a destiny. I couldn't believe, it. I can still give the whole talk. It was wow. just like right there. And I was so excited about it. So the Maharishi was coming to America that summer. Was so, this one of his protégés or something that gave yeah, him Yeah, he had like about 40 different teachers at oh, that okay. point around the world. Really? Yeah. Wow. And it was just the very beginning. Maybe even there's 30 teachers. And he was in Houston. And so Marshy came to the States. So I went up to this one-month hippie course. There was a 1,000 hippies, maybe 2,000 hippies all staying at Poland Springs. And he talked every day. And he'd come out and... Did he the, have a translator or did he speak No, he English? spoke English. Oh, he, he did? He, okay. Really good English. Oh, okay. And he, he's a very funny, happy guy. And so I arrived uh, the first, for the first talk a little bit like on time, but the seats were all taken, 1,000 people in front of me. And I said, well, I'm never doing this again. And so the next day I, I arrived early wanting to get a good seat. And because I was so young and not a VIP, I couldn't really sit up that close. So I pointed myself the usher to make sure nobody else could sit up front. So I was, 
<laughs> so that's why I sat up front all the time. I just said, I'm the usher. And then the, he had the second one-month course he did in America. These are the only two he did. And they said it was completely full. Nobody could come. I went anyway. Okay, and I arrived. They wouldn't give me a ticket. And Maharishi's uh, would travel in entourage. Famous people were traveling with him and so forth. And he'd come in the back door. So I was, I'm kind of a little guy. I would just, the entourage would come in and I would slide in behind him and pretend to be his assistant. I would go oh in every God. day that way. You just have to have chutzpah. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I, just, I just said, I'm the assistant. I walked in, I had no badge, nothing, because I wasn't allowed to be there. Yeah. And I stayed with a friend for a month. And then there was this, then he did it. These are his only courses he did in America, this one month, one month. Then he did a three-month teacher training program with about, I don't know, maybe about 100 of us. They wouldn't let me come. They said I was too young to be a teacher. So I went anyway. How old were you at this time? I was 18, 17, okay. 18, okay. something like that. And... Uh, but, you know, they wanted you to be a college grad. And so, <laughs> so anyway, they said, okay, you can stay, but you can't be a teacher. Anyway, at the end, I talked him into it, became the youngest teacher of Transcendental Meditation. Then he said, you should go back to college. And I went back to college uh, for a few months and got, uh, I got uh, independent study credits for going into his next teacher training program in Europe. Wow. So I, I took every one of his courses for three years, basically. It was right there. And um, so he got familiar with who I was. And eventually, I became his personal assistant. And I lived with him for nine years. And I, was, I wanted to be him. You know, I, if, if I put this in a context of teaching, you, you, you see something, you become inspired by it. It's your soul saying yes. And you got to follow that. And my following that was, was not always easy. It was... Uh, I remember when I gave my first TM lecture after I went to the class to become a TM teacher, uh, I stood up from a little audience of 20 people and uh, fainted. My knees started shaking. I was so anxious. I had so much fear in my body. And I thought, wow, if I have so much fear, maybe this is the wrong occupation. And so then I read an article at that time uh, on Rolling Stones by, with John Lennon. And John Lennon of the Beatles said, the Beatles only toured three years. And Wow, you that's crazy. Did. And actually, when right. I was a kid, I saw the Beatles in Houston, you know, so. Wow, <laughs> and wow. It, and it was amazing. They, as soon as they came on stage, everybody just stood up and started screaming. And you couldn't well, even hear the band, You couldn't right? even hear the band. That's so, a, my mom saw the Beatles at Candlestick in uh, San Francisco. She said, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was exciting because they had long hair and they were cute, but you couldn't hear the music. No, you can't the hear. The PA wasn't strong enough to overpower the teenage the, girls. Oh, the, but it was everybody. It wasn't just the teenage girls. I vowed I wouldn't stand up. As soon yeah. as they walked on stage, I was standing up and screaming right. too. I couldn't believe it. It was such a rush. But the, the point is, they stopped touring because they had so much anxiety before performances. Really? John Lennon said he threw up for hours, you know, he just got it out. He just couldn't endure the tours anymore. It was too much. Wow. Can and you so, imagine, you know, that's just such a, a testament to the folly of the human psyche that some, I mean, not just one person, let's just take John Lennon, the whole group of them obviously is like a super group. They're each individually so talented, but can you imagine the psyche that you're that talented and you're that nervous, you know, how many people could, would die to have the talent of John Lennon in there. He can't go on stage because he's so scared that he sucks, you know, presumably. Well, it's, it's the concept and this is for everybody. I was getting to a point okay, in yeah, my yeah. story, which yeah. is when you're inspired, you're following your heart, genius can come through. That's who you are. So if you fail at that, then you have failed. Wow. If you're doing some mediocre job, that's not really you. You can fail at that, but it's not really you. I don't like this job anyway. So you see, that's the thing. When you do, right. when you follow your heart, that's going to push all your buttons. And for them, it was the reason I point out the story of this. All these people are screaming is what's there to be afraid of? They could have just been strumming their guitars or played an album. <laughs> Nobody would have known. Right. But just that much, that much energy, love energy coming at them. Basically, they couldn't handle it. You have to be able to process that much, that much energy. Now, today, right. 50 years later, uh, part of my whole meditation technique I teach, explain to people, is that most of your, in America particularly, most of your suffering is from too much attention, too much success, too much energy, too much immediate gratification. That's energy that comes to you, and you can't channel that energy out. And so a big part of meditation, and this is an ancient knowledge as well, when people are sick or they're distressed, is you have, that's just blocked energy in the system. You know, we have all these meridians of energy, the chi energy flows through the body. Anytime you're angry or upset or bothered, anything, somewhere you're blocked. And if you're not feeling those emotions, then you're going to feel it as tension in your body, which then erupts into sickness. 
And so there's a whole system of meditation where you learn to channel that energy out of you and then bring in fresh energy. And that's a Taoist system. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of developed my own, but they do it themselves. But that was back at that time. When you follow your heart, it's like the universe says, we're going to support you. And that's a huge amount of energy. And we usually, we have block. What would be a block be? It was that I will fail. I won't be good enough. I'll lose. And so when I got my contract for a minute from Mars, go fast forward quite a bit. Oh my God, there was a, they call it an auction where publishing houses auction back and forth. And my publisher, my agent said, you'd be lucky if you get it 25,000. There was interest in my book because my a previous book had done so well without a publisher. So that was mm. a phenomenon back then. So they were going to buy this book for 25,000, maybe 35 if you're lucky. So now the, it, She's calling. She says, "This would have been in the in the early '80s or this something." Was, this was in 1990. 19, oh, okay, 90. 1990. Okay. Okay. got the contract for Men from Mars. Okay. And <laughs> my wife and I, Bonnie, we were like, "Oh my God, we're getting it. We're getting it." It went up to 55. We're, it was explosive. We could barely hold that. Then it went up to 65. It went up to 85 and 90,000. My agent said, "I can't believe it." And now they postponed it till tomorrow. You know, we were so excited, and we went up to I think 160 thousand dollars. I could not have received anything more. I mean, <laughs> now if I blink, I'd take right. that. But right. then it was literally, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It, it, so all of that energy is coming to you, which is really, I'm believing it's going to happen. You see, when we fully believe I can have it, I can do it, pull the energy through. It's only us that limits the energy of we're not good enough, we don't deserve, I will fail, I'll hurt somebody, I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not prepared, I'm not ready. These are all belief systems that we have that blocked that energy. But I really wanted a best-selling book, you know, and I was mm -hmm. so excited about this. It's a big dream for me, best-selling book, and get my message out there. So that's desire, strong desire, and the door is starting to open, huge amounts of energy. Couldn't have received more. Then what happened, as soon as I signed that contract, I couldn't sleep. When I, I, I mean, I could sleep uh, a little bit, and then at four o'clock, at three o'clock in the morning, this energy would come into my belly and wake me up. I mean, it was painful, and I did not want to get up, but it was more painful to lie in bed than go and start writing this book. And then once I get into right. the flow, everything was fine. And then if I didn't get up, because I'm a bit lazy, <laughs> the energy would just come and grip me in the belly and made me write that book. I mean, it was amazing how powerful. Once I signed the contract, said I'm going to do it, it's like I made a contract with the universe. It's coming right. through, and then you have to deliver, and if you don't deliver, you suffer. And so a lot of people, in order to avoid suffering, they avoid really putting themselves out there. Or they take a step and the fear comes up, <laughs> which is their own resistance to it. So they back off and go, oh, it's not important. I won't get there. You know, it's not for me. It's Dude, not a big deal. This is hilarious. You're describing exactly what happened when I decided to start a podcast. I recorded like 10 interviews and I could have started it. But the way that you do it typically is you do the first one is kind of you telling your story. And I was so blocked from doing that because you just have to sit by yourself in a microphone. It's awkward and it just, it was insurmountable. So I sat on these interviews that I did for maybe, I don't know, six, nine months or something until a couple people reached out and said, Hey, I did an interview with you. Where the hell is it? I was like, Oh shit, I got to put this thing out. And then that, you know, finally it was embarrassing enough. I was like, well, I got to put them out somehow. So it made me do my first one and launch it. But I went through that sort of paralysis of committing to something that I had a feeling was going to be good, but it really required some vulnerability. Yeah, and, yeah. And, will, and willingness to, you know, face possible rejection. I want to take you back, though, okay. to, your, to your nervousness yeah. of... So much anxiety. So, so you're oh. becoming a TM teacher, and, yeah. and it's time for you to give your talk, and you're freaking out. What, what happens after that, and how does the relationship with your teacher um, develop over time after that? And, well, I don't know how much detail to go in. I kind of went into so much detail then, but... Uh, Anyway, I read that article with John Lennon, and I say, if John Lennon can be anxious and throw up before talks, I can, because clearly right. he was following his path. And a, a big story goes on where I hung around Marshy enough where I became his personal assistant. And that's a fun story, just about persistence and confidence. It was, uh, he had two personal assistants, and these were all wealthy guys, much older than me. And you know, when you're 20 years old, or 19 years old, uh, somebody who's 25 seems much older. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah, they're, they're like big shots and yeah. 28. You know? <laughs> yeah, and they also yeah. happen to be wealthy people. He carried people. Most of the people around him had money already, so he didn't have to pay salaries. They're like volunteers. He ran Got kind it. of a volunteer thing. Got it. And so he had these two assistants, and 
I was hanging around at one of the courses, and he had his floor at the hotel. He usually rent out these big resorts and whatever for these courses, thousands of people. And, and on his floor, there was, they were called the 108s. They were the special group, and they were these guys. And, and so the two assistants, one of them got fired, and then the other, so he had one assistant for a while, and everybody's thinking, oh, I want to become the assistant. How do you get to be the assistant? And then the other guy, a family member got sick, so there was no assistant. But there was the Maharishi in his suite, and he'd push his little button, and the assistant would come in and talk to him and tell him what to do and let people in and that kind of a thing. You're the door yeah. guy. Right, right. And <laughs> so, so this, this, all these, there were like nine of them. They were all sitting in chairs, and they had decided they're going to take turns going in when he rings his buzzer. So I thought, well, I'll go sit there, and I'll be number 10. And so I would go sit there and say, well, you can't be here. You're not a 108. So I was intimidated, and I got <laughs> Okay, I'll leave. I went back to my room. I just felt terrible. I felt, oh, just, I cried, you know. I was just like, no, my dreams are not going to come true. <laughs> I can't be the assistant. I wanted to be the assistant. Yeah. So I wake up in the morning really early, and I said, I'm just going to go up there anyway. I don't care what they say. So I went up, and I sat next to the door. And, and I waited about 20 minutes, and so one of the other assistants comes out, or one of the potential assistants comes in. He says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm the new assistant. And it's time to go and rest. And send him away. Now, it's wow. time to go and rest is a phrase Marishi would use to politely tell people to get out of my room. Mm. Time mm -hmm. to go and rest. So, <laughs> so I just, I didn't say Marishi said it. I just said, and it's time to go and rest. Well, who are you? I'm the new assistant. So he went away. <laughs> Next guy comes. Same thing. Next guy comes. Oh, Same my thing. God, dude. I kicked all of them off the floor, so it was just me. And I kept everybody off the floor <laughs> until he would ring the buzzer, and I would go in. And he would have me do things and make arrangements and call people in or whatever. But I kept everybody away for about two days until it was all everybody understood I was the new assistant. Oh, my God. That's, <laughs> that's the best story. Uh, oh, it goes, it goes on. It is good. Well, do, I, I mean, I love this stuff. And one thing when we talked about this particular topic before, I think you, you caught on that I, you know, I'm very enamored by some of the powers that these mystics have. You know, sometimes they're false and they're just doing magic tricks and sleight of hand, but sometimes they really do miraculous things. And I've known, I've never seen miracles per se, but I've had firsthand recounts by people that I know, A, aren't liars, and B, aren't insane. They're telling me, no, I saw this happen. Just crazy yeah. stuff by yeah. location and all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah. When you were um, spending the next nine years with him, oh, what you had told me is like, Luke, don't get caught up in that shit. It's just kind of a signpost that certain, pe certain people are gifted with certain abilities that they can sort of use to help impress people to bring them into the fold not in a, in a negative sense but it's like showing someone there is a god there's something like yeah. higher here yeah. and i'm tapped into it so right. they're given these powers for a period of time to kind of like show people through the veil of the limitations of this corporal experience that's a nice way of saying it all yeah so you said luke it's not about getting caught up in enlightenment. It's about really taking those teachings and becoming a householder and doing work in the world. And I, it really hit me when you said that because I had kind of always thought as a spiritual aspirant that the goal is just enlightenment straight up until you don't have to incarnate anymore and you're out of here, you know? And your take, as I remember, it was sort of like, no, you might study with the masters, but then you take what you learn and you serve right, here. Right. And you might start a company and have kids and get married and like be very much a person that's in the world, but still have a spiritual framework by which you live. That said, when you were with, because I just love this shit and you got to humor me, when you were with him for those nine years, did you witness any things that couldn't be explained by physics or just the common things that we hold true? Those Miracles nine, those, of such. Those nine years were amazing, amazing experience of enlightenment process for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I can describe all these amazing experiences I had. But as far as someone doing the bavuti, someone doing moving things, objects, making manifestations, that wasn't his thing. Since then, I know several who do that and have gone to India and practiced some of that stuff mm -hmm. and been initiated in some of that stuff. And uh, there was a time, I, I, what had happened was a, a yogi came from India who could do that. And uh, he had somebody call me up and said that uh, his teacher, who's in, on the other side, told him to come to me to teach me how to do this stuff. Wow. 
So he says that. I, I'm not impressed. You know, I'm in my heyday. I've got my own jet. I fly around teaching classes everywhere. You know, this guy comes over here. And I'm all spiritual, okay, but I feel like I, I'm, I'm doing my work here. I don't need, uh, you know, nine years of meditation, what happens is you find yourself one with the universe, okay, and your heart opens, and sex is great then. You're bringing the energy down. Love is great. Children are great. Work is successful. You're on your mission, and the energy is flowing down into the world, which is what you're just talking about. So around that time in my life, this guy comes, and his name is Swami Kleshwar. He's passed on now. He's a young guy, you know. He's just like 25 or something, and I'm at that time maybe 50, okay? But he comes, and I don't need any gurus at this point. I'm a teacher myself, you know. I'm, that's, I said, fine, you know, come, I'll visit you. But then he walks over, and he says, you're having a conversation. Some people are there, and he says, well, I've been, ta I've been told to come and, and share with you, uh, teach you if you wish, uh, uh, more. I said, no, I don't really need that. And then he says, and then somebody in the room who knew him said, oh, but have you seen him do this? And he said, well, I don't do tricks like that, but for, for you, I will show you a little something. And he walked over to me, and he, um, I don't know if he did his hand like that that time. He just, uh, he did this. His hand was like this, and he did this. For those listening, showing an open palm and he then kind of pinching his like fingers there, together. Pulled his pinchers, fingers together, and plop. It was like a big drop of water hit my hand and then was powder. And it was this white powder. Wow. And that's called Bhavuti. Right. And there's a lot of guys in India, maybe 20 that I know of, yeah. uh, who can do Bhavuti. Yeah. Now, these guys are not necessarily ethical people. Right. That's what people have to understand is that they, they, they did mantras for a certain amount of time. And the mantras are frequencies of certain non-physical beings and those non-physical beings do that for them now some people would say those non-physical beings are angels some would say they're spirits some would say they're demons what well, take your pick but you do these mantras for a long long time big dedication to it till your mind can resonate in this frequency and they'll do things for you so that's what the bhavuti is you can do bhavuti you can do you can, they'll materialize stuff. He'll materialize jewelry in front of you. His hand will go whirl, swirl around and then plop, something will come out of it. Now he can do that. And there's nothing there. He's pulled his sleeves up, everything. You're like right there, you see it. And I was in training and he wanted to teach me all these things. And so with his help, I would experience doing those things. But wow, he was, really? yeah, I would do these initiations and wow. they're very elaborate. And yeah, then, yeah. Anyway, they, they go on. It's a, it was a three-year program. So every three months, I went for three or four days to India for my program to get these mantras and do these practices and do these so forth things. And I was asking. And you're like in your 50s at this time? I'm in my 50s at wow. that time. Uh, you know, I made it with Men Are From Mars. And, uh, you know, here this thing came along. I said, you know, I'm always open to new ideas and whatever. Right. And there was a part of me back in my OTM days. It felt like, gee, the powers, those powers didn't come, you know. I thought, all, you know, part of me like, well, that sounds cool to do. Yeah, yeah. So I went and we, we did the three-year three, three -year program. And well, I'll tell you another thing, very interesting. I, I, I never told anybody this, but it's interesting. He was wanting me to learn these things. He said, this will inspire people to recognize there's more. There's no value in it in itself to make a trinket appear. And right. when you make the trinket appear, he goes out and buys them. They sit in another room, and you do a little prayer over them to pull the angel into that frequency. And then you, you, then in the presence of someone, you call it, and it appears in your hand. Does it move from the location it where it was? It disappears, and it comes <laughs> here and appears. Holy shit. And uh, I saw him doing it in the other room, and I saw he bought the thing, and then suddenly it appeared here. Now, it takes a lot. You only can do it so much because this you got to build it's up. Energetically this, energetic, draining? It's energetically draining. So right. you have to build it up a lot. And then so what they'll do is the audience will chant for a while. You know, some of these gurus, you'll have people chanting for hours and hours. That They're building up the energy in the room. And then you take that energy. You have to build it. Or you can do it all yourself, but it's much harder if you have a bunch of followers out there chanting and you'll just suck the energy in to be able to do this. You, so... Anyway, so one time he was teaching me to do um, uh, bavuti. And I said, you know, bavuti, it's this is powder, right? Yeah. It's and like incense ash. It actually, it's the result where he gets it from. It's also transferred. Oh, they make these, wow. They do these yagyas 
where they, it's like incense ash, but what yeah. it is is they do these offerings to fires, to the gods and so forth. And then the, what's left is holy ash and that's bavudi. Mm. So they can transfer the holy ash. And so they got a lot of it, easy to transfer that. So, so I'm steady with it. And literally this happened. Okay. So I, I said, you know, the bavudi thing in America is not going to go over. I don't think it's going to inspire anybody. And, and I was always sort of hesitant about this. It was all interesting. And then he, and I said, now, if you could turn water to wine, now that would be something, you know. <laughs> so he said, can do. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I said, he said, so get me a glass of water. Okay. I handed him the glass of water. He held the glass of water. He put his hand over it, did his bavuti thing, and the powder went into the water. And he says, can you smell it? I said, no. He said, okay, I'll make it stronger. Put a little more ash in it. <laughs> and then he said, here, taste it was like brandy. Wow. And I still had it. I, you know, I don't have it anymore, but it was, uh, it was real. Wow. I got a container. I brought it home. I showed you. <laughs> and so these are, th these are like, there's books, you know, for thousands of years in India that have mantras to do these various things. And I can't explain it. I can, I, you know, yeah. I saw it. I know the mantras. You do them. I mean, I got really into energy healing. One of the initiations for energy healing was he had, uh, one of them was 32 different uh, power saints, okay? These are the guys who can do bavuti, okay? Mm -hmm. they, and uh, it might have been 16 for this one, the later one was 32. This is a long time ago, 18 years ago. So the, um, they're chanting for a week this particular mantra, this healing mantra for this particular angel. And they chant for a week with my name in it, my name in it. And then all I have to do is show up and for 12 hours from midnight to six o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock to six o'clock in the morning, I have to meditate and, and uh, use that mantra. So I'm doing the mantra and then the initiation happens. So I'm resonating in that frequency and I can meditate 15 hours pretty easily. So it's not a big deal to me. And uh, so, so then they all come in and I didn't know this was gonna happen. And they said, okay, we've, this is the Cobra. I had a video camera fil filming this thing, I have it at home. And they, they wanted me to video the cobra's mouth to make sure you can see the sack, the poison sack, because evidently I suppose you can remove poison sacks from cobras. And then they have a village volunteer, this woman <laughs> who puts her finger out and the cobra bites it. <laughs> I'm supposed to heal that. Oh uh, my God, <laughs> talk about pressure. Yeah. You well, were nervous just to go give a talk on meditation. Well, see, they didn't even tell me any of that was going to happen. Oh they, they're God, just like, dude. suddenly there's this big cobra they're holding and they caught it and they're holding the cobra and there's this woman and they say, and they say what's happening? And I said, you're going to suck the poison out energetically. And so, which is part of what some healers do is you pull the energy out, you pull it out. So I do the mantra and, and pull the energy out. And... We didn't get it on camera, so I said, we need to do it again. <laughs> to bite again. Poor lady. This is a devoted uh, yeah, this follower, a, this woman. See, this guy who'd come over, he became famous in India because he could heal cobra bites. Mm. That was his thing. If somebody has a cobra bite, he says he can't heal it unless it's right away. It has to be pretty soon. And once it takes over your body, you, you can't stop that. But in the beginning, you can. And I said, well, we don't have cobras in America. So he says, no, it's the energy. It's the poisonous energy mm. you pull that energy from it and if it hasn't done a lot of damage to the body then then you can stop it so i did that initiation and then my eyes turned yellow and i was kind of woozy afterwards and then we had all these guys i must have been the 32 if i remember now in this little room and they all put their hands over my head and i'm now sending that negative energy they call it negative energy out into the into a, another uh, uh, healing object which was a somebody's healing stick and so I put it into that and so then that's practicing what they call decharging so you send the energy out of you. you you find something natural frequency and you send it into that and it's converted into positive energy so the next day they <laughs> he said okay this is we're going to do the initiation again tomorrow night and this is a scorpion and <laughs> the guy walks over with a leash on a scorpion this big, we're talking six or eight inches big with this big, <laughs> big thing at the end, the, the, the hook. I said, no way. We, 
I'm not going to do that. <laughs> he said, no, we have volunteer here. I said, no, not going to do a scorpion bite because they actually take a chunk of your skin out, you know. Oh, my God. And he showed me a guy, the guy who was volunteering had it done before, and it was a big chunk of his skin that didn't have taken out, like a, you know, a half an inch of ripped out from this. Anyway, so this was all just was happening to me. And, and lots of things. Every time I went on a trip, something unusual and, and was prepared. And at this time, were you already with Bonnie? Oh, I've been married to Bonnie. We got married in, in 1985. Uh, and so what's yeah. she thinking when you take off to India? Or did she go with you? Or are you just like, hey, no, this is no, my, this well, is my few, mission. I'm uh, going to go. Yeah, a few times she went with me. But she was not really that thrilled about it. Mm-hmm. One husband's gone for a week, you know, every Especially three months. Especially up to these kind of hijinks. I <laughs> yeah, and this was all kind of weird. And, and, and so... Anyway, he prepared this. He had, he had uh, 32 disciples, his best disciples, and he now said, uh, now I'm going to transfer all the power so you don't depend on me for anything. And he's going to do what's called Mahasamadhi. Mahasamadhi is where the, the guru leaves his body. His body's dead. Okay, so he's going to consciously leave. That was one of his cities, which is to travel, soul travel, where you can leave out of your body, and he would do that many times. And, uh, but the... And, and, and people reported him by locating too. I never saw that or anything like that. But uh, so he orchestrated this big ceremony. He gave me kind of a sense of it where there's going to be 32 disciples out here and each city, the 32 cities, these are powers, were going to mm-hmm. go through me, one to each of them. And as it went through me, I would retain that and have that ability. And I've been practicing these things with him in various degrees. And I told my wife about it. I was oh, so excited. Finally, this class is done. I'll have all these powers. And she says, if you go, don't come back. Oh, wow. And that was my choice. And she, I went, put oh. a, she put her foot down finally. Yeah, she said, this is, I don't want to be married to a person like that. And I said, okay, well, I love you, sweetie. I won't go. Wow. And I, wow. I kind of feel my own journey. That was this sort of, again, the renunciation of ego. Right. Because I only wanted those powers to look important. You know, right. this, you know I, can, I can simply talk and inspire people to be better. Sure. And I don't have to do that. And I think that's kind of the old, old way of transforming people. There's, there's a, like the guru is better than you in so many ways. And, and you're always less than them. And we're more on an equal plane now. And, you know, all the teachers here, they're regular people. And they have issues and whatever. But they have wisdom and they have knowledge. And they're sharing that with people. I'm a regular guy. I have wisdom and knowledge. And I just happen to, I'm particularly good at meditation. I've devoted my life to meditation. And that gives me uh, the extra ability to have empathy and compassion Mm -hmm. and peace of mind. And when you have that, you can understand people better. And I share that with people. And that's my work. Right. I don't have to be this uh, magic man. Where you don't have yeah. to run around with mala beads and orange robes <laughs> in no, order no. to do and, your, and your have, dharma. And, and the people, the, these guys who could do this, they were not exceptional people. They were born with certain abilities and gifts, and right. they did certain processes that developed. Kind of like if you, if you see a, like a Chinese acrobat, it's like, how can you ever do that? You know, they do the craziest things with their body. You, know, you can't do that. It doesn't mean they're necessarily an ethical person, a loving person, a compassionate person, a generous person, a person that's actually helping the world in many ways. Right. Uh, uh, that doesn't go along with that. It's an ability, and they've developed that ability, and they came in with that ability to be as a part of their potential. So, Do you think that some of these gurus, and I have one in, in mind in particular, and I'll explain why, but do you think some are perhaps have a, a wholesome intention and are a person of God to begin with. They have a teaching to deliver. They have a dharma. They have these abilities. And then through gaining popularity and followers, they get overtaken by ego and get attached to these abilities and the followers and the prestige. And then perhaps lose the ability, but then kind of become a charlatan and fake it because they don't want people to know that they've lost these powers? Evidently, that's what happened to the fake Sai Baba. They're, in India, the most famous of these miracle men... This is who I'm thinking yeah, of. Is, is, yeah. Satya Sai Baba. Well, so Satya Sai Baba is different from Shirdi Sai Baba. Shirdi right. Sai Baba is this very cool guy all over India. He's got his hand up and he's blessing people. And right. he has uh, interesting stories with him too. But uh, the other Sai Baba... 
has a really dark side, which I don't even want to talk about, but he mm. has a very dark side. And the young guy, the 25-year-old that came to me, he said Satya Sai Baba came to him offering him you know, $5 million if he would come and be his student and do the miracles for him because he'd lost most of his powers. And now he was just using sleight of hand. Right. Because you can do sleight of hand. If people are right. really believing, then they're not going to be looking so carefully. Right. So. so I think the beginning of my fascination with this whole phenomenon was because when I was earlier on in life, I was really struggling, having a very hard time, very self-destructive, the whole thing, living in Hollywood, just dark times. And so members of my dad's side of the family started going over on these pilgrimages to Puta Party and visiting the ashram of Satya Sai Baba. And I'm, you know, completely out of my mind. I'm not spiritual. I don't believe in God. I'm not religious. I got none of that going on. But my life started progressively get worse and worse. And they would come back and have these stories where he would produce Fubuti or he would make a ring and bless people and they said that in his presence they just felt this unconditional peace and love. And these are people that were not hippies. They were pragmatic, regular people, and I knew that they were ethical and they weren't lying to me and I could I was pretty certain that they weren't completely delusional. So this began my first interest in kind of the Eastern mysticism and the gurus, which eventually led me to go to Puta Party myself and sit in Darshan with Sai Baba, who I think by then had probably lost his powers and was doing sleight of hand stuff. But it's interesting that I was still attracted by that because it was something otherworldly. And he would do things like the bilocating and come and speak to a group of people that were international and all spoke different languages and everyone in the room would hear it in their native tongue. So mm -hmm. the German mm -hmm. would hear German, the Spanish mm -hmm. would hear Spanish, etc. And these are my aunts and my grandmother went over there even and they're not crazy. So I thought, hmm, if this guy can do those things, perhaps one of these guys can help me. Mm -hmm. And I was terribly stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I started praying to Sai Baba. I had a little picture of him, mm -hmm. you know, and I was delivered from my suffering. Now, I don't know if it had anything to do with him or just surrendering finally and accepting help from a higher power in a general sense. But that began my fascination with, with these phenomena. And then I came to find out, and this brings me to my next question for you, and we can kind of move out of this topic. But <laughs> I found out that when I was I remembered actually, but I just didn't know what had happened. But my mom had taken me to see a guru in Oakland around 1978, 79, when I was eight or nine. And you'll be able to guess who it was. Muktananda. Yeah. Yeah. She took me to see Muktananda at, at the Sashram. And I remember, I mean, I remember the incense. I remember the joy. And singing. Yeah, the singing, um, the kirtan, the, everyone taking their shoes off. And I could run around and be free. And it was like the kids were happy. And then I went up to receive his blessing and I remember that that was a really powerful experience although I don't remember what he said so I later asked my mom about it I said what was that thing we did she says oh that was Muktananda he would there was kind of a scene around his ashram in Oakland and a friend yeah. of mine brought us yeah. there and and um, I think that that Shakti experience really had an impact on me and it was perhaps the first time that I was aware of that kind of morphic energetic field of consciousness in a room yeah and then later went to find out he was actually a pretty well-known saint and, and did some pretty amazing things and have heard a lot of crazy stories about his abilities of bilocation and all of these things and um, I believe when we talked before you had mentioned that you spent a little time around him so I'm yeah I'm curious if you have any stories about Muktananda specifically uh yeah I mean <laughs> well when I first met Muktananda I was in charge of the TM center in South Fallsburg and we had a big TM uh, center there where people could come live in residence and so he opened up one to the hotel next door and he'd go on a walk every morning and I would go down to the lake every morning to meditate and so we ended up walking together every morning and it was me who introduced him to Maharishi and then Maharishi invited him to his ashram in Switzerland and so forth but my first experience he invited me to come over to his place and I went over and did one of the uh, intensive they called it I think and <laughs> he goes around and pats people or whatever with me he came up and he blows up my nose okay, he takes <laughs> deep breath and puts his air into my body <laughs> wow <laughs> and afterwards I, for about a day I was like singing all these Sanskrit songs really <laughs> yes yes I think I was somewhat familiar with them but right, I'm not right. sure but they were just coming out of me I, I was right. feeling very Indian I'll say it like that right but it's um I mean, I remember one time, okay, when, when in my frisky days of, of um, wasn't always celibate uh, between marriage, um, 
uh, I made love with this girl down in Mexico, and the next day I was singing Mexican songs, you know, and dancing like Mexico, you know. <laughs> so, so there's a transference of energy right. whenever you open your heart to someone. And you chant all that energy together in a group, and a guru often has the ability to receive and give back. It's a, uh, there's different chakra energy centers, and in different people, you're born with certain ones more developed than others. And so you could have one of them develop more. And the third eye chakra center, in some people, there's several channels in it, and some people reflex. So if you give me your devotion, that energy comes back to you. And uh, so some people have the ability to send that energy back. Now, I actually have that ability. I'm born with that ability. I'm charismatic. People are charismatic. I stand in an audience and I just come alive. You know, I could be sick with the flu and I stand in front of an audience. The flu's gone and the energy just goes out and people have an experience, you know. But it's not a glorification of me. It's just they all feel men are wonderful and women are wonderful. You know, you just leave so happy and... Um, uh, because they've given me this energy and I'm able to give it right back. And that's through meditation, many, many years of meditation, you, you clear those channels so that you can receive the divine energy and offer it. And then when people are, are thinking, oh, I've just given you all this trust to come be with you. I paid this money to come be with you. That, that's like an offering. They're offering their energy. You travel a long distance to see a guru. That's offering your energy. Uh, I remember one time I flew from San Francisco to Bombay, took a helicopter to Shirdi to visit the ashram of the real Shirdi Baba, uh, where he's passed on a long time ago. But, um, and I go there and meeting my friend, the Swami Kleshwar, and Kleshwar says, oh, Shirdi is so happy you're here, and, and, um, but you must make an offering. And, and I was feeling good, you know, and my meditations were good, so-so. And... Uh, and he says, Shirdi likes japatis. So we'll go get some japatis, these little Indian breads. And we had this big tray of little japatis and a big picture of him and this room next to the big area where everybody would go and another kind of VIP room where VIPs go. And, and the big picture of Shirdi. And he said, now offer the, the japatis to, to Shirdi. And I offered it and kabang. That was it. It was like the most profound shift I'd ever experienced by doing nothing except offering the japatis. Mm -hmm. Because what just happened is the japatis, it's an offering, become the means through which he can transfer his energy to me. And all of the energy wasn't just the energy of offering japatis. It was the energy of coming all the way, the, the commitment, the money, the time, the, you know, you have to have a lot of, trust in something to do all that so you're, that's energy you're offering to someone but for it to come back it has to come through something on this plane and so it came back through the japatis so I just literally he just said just put the japatis there and bang and he said to me and bonnie now go meditate and we just went into deep deep breathless samadhi and ever since that day it's effortless for me to go into a deep breathless samadhi really just, I just wow and breathless samadhi at least the way i experienced it is if you put a feather, you wouldn't see hardly anything under my nose. It's just simply, but there's a tiny, tiny bit of air that goes into the brain, but the lungs have stopped moving completely and the belly is locked. It's a, what? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> oh my this God, is breathless that's, meditation. That's uh, wild. I've never yeah. heard of that. Yeah, that's, that's so a, cool. But that's when I, it was, it, I don't know if I'd had that experience before, but it was just, I'm just sitting there in meditation and go, holy mackerel, I'm not breathing at all. And this, I'm not doing anything. And this is happening, right. you know, which is uh, amazing. So that helped me understand the whole idea of all of these ceremonies in every single religion. You put a deity in front of you, a symbol of the deity, and you make offerings to it. Mm -hmm. The offerings is you're giving your energy. And you're giving an offering. You're saying, here, here, use this fire, the fire ceremony, water ceremony. Use this water ceremony for purifying me. Okay, use this fire. Take away all anger inside of me and give me peace. So you set an intention. You make an offering to the higher energies of the universe. And then that energy comes through the offering to you. Because, see, you the energy would already give it to you and you'd already have it if you were open to it. There's some, some blockage inside of you or lack of intention or lack of desire because desire is what pulls energy in. And the reason why desire has been 
pushed down throughout the ages, give up desire, give up desire, is really give up the attachment to desire. And people really uh, got that confused. But, you know, oh, I have desire, and if I don't get what I want, then I'm unhappy. Now, the idea is to, I want more, and I'm so excited because I'm going to get more. And it will come at the right time in the right place, and I'll make the choices, and I'll be guided, and the right people will come to me, and it's going to happen if I keep wanting it. And sometimes along the way, you kind of go, well, that's kind of the wrong desire. I'm going to adjust it to something better or something more appropriate. Because sometimes our desires aren't really soul desires. But mm. desire is the pulling yeah. in. If you look at the word to want, it's to want in Old English is to not have. So the universe is here to always provide for us. It's grace. And desire is to say to the universe, okay, this is what I still don't have. So deliver. <laughs> and faith is, is trusting that it's going to come. Then you're patient, right. then you're not grumpy, you're not irritable, you're, you're in the flow. And so the idea of the offerings is you would make these offerings and they're pure frequencies. And for me, the, the idea was they're more expensive. I mean, I, when I would get in a helicopter and go over these holy sites where the, where the water was and get these big bricks of gold and throw it in. That was my offering. Wow. Now, why would I do that? Because I, right now, I can, I'm instantly in that helicopter throwing a big grip of, brick of gold into that water. So I'm at that place. I ground myself on those places. And if I put a quarter in, I'd probably forget that. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> but I pay for a helicopter in India, fly over a holy spot, drop the gold down. And like, holy, you know, this is like, but the reality is you'll never forget that. You know, one time I, w I went to Egypt to the Great Pyramids and. That's a lot of stories there, but one, one story is I wanted to... Uh, Did you ever meditate in, in the pyramid? Oh, yeah. I meditated oh, wow. on top of the pyramid, fully under the pyramid, the king's chamber of the pyramid. Oh. Oh, I know the guy who owns the pyramid. It's actually, the pyramid is owned by the mayor of the little town next to the pyramid. And we're friends. He's taken me to the top twice. Uh, wow. The last time he took me, uh, when he was young, he was like the champion who could do it faster than anybody. And then it was illegal, but he got me to the top because he's the mayor. Then I came back on this, by coincidence, it was 30 years later, 20 to 50, yeah, around that time, and uh, yeah, it was, and I didn't even think about it, but it was exactly the same full moon as 30 years before that I'd been there, and he brought me to the top, and I said, I want to go to the top, and there's a big police station there, and nobody can climb to the top, people dying all the time, jumping off, whatever, but, or falling off, it's really dangerous, and so I stood there for three hours meditating on the pyramid, exchanging energy with it. And, and all the people were watching me because they never seen anybody do this. And they, they all concerned that I was so, I'd be cold because it was cold and I didn't have a warm jacket. So they, I said, it's okay. And then they brought me jackets. And so that I was sitting there, blanket, then a jacket. And they said, you shouldn't be out here. You shouldn't be out here. I said, I'm going to the top of the pyramid. I'm going to the top of the pyramid. <laughs> And they said, it's illegal, you can't go to the top. I'm going to the top of the pyramid. <laughs> I just kept saying, I'm waiting for the man to take me to the top of the pyramid. So we're traveled around this little village that surrounds the pyramid. And so they brought me to the house of the mayor because he was the guy who could go to the top of the pyramid. So I was sitting there and they had a nice deck and I could sit and meditate on the pyramid. It was very close. And he came and I reminded him, 30 years ago, you took me to the top. He remembered me. And he now was, he was my age, but he didn't age well. <laughs> he was really overweight and kind of old looking. Right. I said, you got to take me to the top. So, no, no, I'm too old. It's illegal. I can't do it. The police station, now right in the easy spot, because it was an easy spot and a difficult spot. Yeah. The dark side, nobody goes up. It's too dangerous. He said, I cannot go up there. I can take you up the little ones, the little pyramids. We go over there now. I said, no, no, got to go to the top. So I persuaded him. We went up on the dangerous side. He couldn't make it all the way up. But uh, it, was, it was my second time. And then I meditated under the full moon for many hours on top of the pyramid and, and left something as well. Wow. So I'm and still did there. And did you sense um, a different energy on top of that pyramid than oh, you would potent. on top of a oh. building here in London? Oh, so I mean, I'm asking no, a dumb question, but, no, I'm, but you, you know, just want to get I want the contrast. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, massive, massive. Really? It's just voltage, voltage. I mean, I get massive tingling through my body with a rose, okay, with a flower. Yeah, that's a chi energy. But those places are powerful places. And, and a lot of people can't feel it. I mean, you have to learn how to do this. I, I can teach, most people can learn very quickly if someone teaches them. Mm -hmm. But they just don't know how to do it. 
I can teach you right now. Let's do it. Okay, so just put your hands here. So you, you see the fingertips, the whole thing. This is the master's secret. It's the fingertips. And so I'm going to just help awaken the fingertips, and then you don't need me at all. Okay. okay so it's, there's a frequency. And the, it's how do we touch the world? Through our hands, through our fingers. So they're like little antennas. Now, what I do to activate this is I have my little mantra, which is I call upon the powers of the universe. Come. Need your help. Say your name out loud. Luke. Say your whole name. Luke Story. You feel that? Already energy's coming to you. Luke Story. Oh, I need something natural. Oh, I'm going to get some water. I could use me, but I don't have to use me. Otherwise, you think it's me. <laughs> here's, here's some water. So we're going to use this water frequency. I'm just tuning it. I use water frequency. Using this water. I do this every morning in the shower. I love it. Just let that water come over. The Egyptians did it. And you're going to an Egyptian temple. You always go to the baths first, these holy waters. You do prayers over the water. Okay, using this water. Bless Luke's story right now. So I call upon the powers of the universe. Come. We need your help. Activate the fingertips and the hand in Luke's story so we can feel the energy. That's the first step is feeling the energy. Use this water. Using this water, send the chi energy. Now, if you have belief in angels, that's more fun. So using this water, send your angels. Come. Right now. Thank you. Now you feel something in your hands? Mm -hmm. That's the energy. That's the chi mm -hmm. energy. Literally, people who do chi kung uh, often don't feel it. They just use something ideally the movements is you're basically calling upon the universal energy using this slow movement activate the energy so that's also most anybody can feel it that way but here's the next step once you can feel the energy you feel it mm -hmm. okay now using this water take away any blocks to more energy so we're going to aim at the water and you imagine energy flowing out. So right now by your angels, take away the blocked energy. And the blocked energy, you have to feel it for it to go out. So here you're tuned into this high frequency and you're feeling any stress that's going on in your life. Any anxiousness, any anger, any disappointment, any kind of not totally great feeling, you feel that. And feeling that, you now send that energy out. So take away the blocked energy. Now if somebody was sick, you said take away the blocked energy of this sickness. And for sickness, oh, see that? You feel something? Mm -hmm. That's the energy going out. Because right away for you, as soon as that energy goes out, more energy starts coming in. And that then starts creating a spiral. So that's when they're doing this. They're getting in touch with that sucking energy. You create a spiral. And that spiral starts pulling in energy in. And then it, you gather it. It just increases more and more. So that's the meditation. It's just feeling that energy. First thing is you send it always. So to keep the energy flowing in, you have to keep sending energy out. That's exchanging. And it circulates, assimilates, accumulates. I don't know how this comes across on video, but <laughs> <laughs> how did, what was your experience? Well, it's interesting. My uh, mind, I notice when my mind gets quiet. Because it's like when you're in a room with an air conditioner and you don't notice the air conditioner and then it shuts off and it, you're like, whoa, it just got quiet. Mm. So I'm managing the conversation. I'm aware of different things. And so my mind's fairly active. And when we were doing that, you know, A, I didn't have to engage anything of thought, but my thought went really quiet, very still. Mm. But in my hands, I felt um, kind of a tingling, like an electricity. That's the first part of it. Eventually, yeah. it's coming up your legs. It's coming down your body. It's, the, it's coming around your body. 
all these things eventually happen, but you start with constantly sending that you have the key to this is you're mm -hmm. always letting go of negativity. Mm -hmm. See, people, people get caught up being spiritual because they're trying to be positive all the time. Mm -hmm. So they're in denial of another part of them, which is the blocked energy. Right. So they can't pull in more. Right. So, they, so a state of contentment is, is slow death. Okay. It's aliveness, enthusiasm, happiness, joy, and fulfillment, motivation, all the cool things that we live in. Right. People get stuck. It's, they get stuck in their life because it's too much energy coming in. It becomes uncomfortable. That's why people eat too much. Mm. There's too much energy is coming in. They're getting what they want. We live in a world where we have instant gratification. Amazon, I want this, it comes. <laughs> I yeah, want yeah. this, it comes. I mean, this is the power of the mind. All this is happening. Instant gratification everywhere. But the, the problem with that, if you don't get, some, you're so used to getting more and more. If you don't get it, you, you get really frustrated and upset and bothered. And, and, and so that's all grist for the mill. They go, oh, okay, great. More energy came. Now it's time for me to process that and send that energy out. And you'll see what happens is flowers, cut flowers absorb the energy. That's why when somebody's sick, you give them cut flowers. They'll pull negative energy out of somebody. They just love to suck it in because they they're not grounded into the earth. So they'll Whoa. pull it out. So you, this tradition, these things work. You make an offering wow. for... In a Catholic church, you offer flowers, always around holy people or whatever. They have flowers so that right. the flowers absorb all the negativity that's coming out of people. Okay. Whoa. Because you have to realize when you walk into a room and you feel good, it's because negativity just came out of you. Energy wow. just came out. Wow. So that's how, that's a Taoist way of understanding. It's a Hindu way of understanding. Mm. It. It's a, a way of, but you just see the traditions everywhere. Then the, the another one, which is the, for the, uh, motivational speaker, uh, entertainer, a singer, Barbara Streisand. Okay, so Barbara Streisand, for example, doesn't perform because she has so much anxiety before performances. You've heard that? No, I didn't know. Oh, that. yeah, she'll never do performances out. Oh, wow. For the longest time, she does studio albums and so forth. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, she'll do an event, but she talks about it. She has huge anxiety that she has to go through. Where that comes from is all the energy that comes at her. Everybody thinks she's fantastic, and she is. She's, a, she's got a channel of angel music, flows through her voice. So all the energy comes to her. And once she's flowing, energy's going out, the energy's moving. But as soon as she's off stage, can she continue to send that much energy into her life? Mm. So typically with opera singers and whatever, traditionally you throw flowers at them. And you go into the, the VIP room, flowers everywhere. Because the flowers wow. help to absorb all of that energy that's now blocked because they're no longer sending that energy out. If you look at Michael Jackson, he said the only time he was happy in his life was on stage singing. Because when you have a talent, okay, and you're doing your talent, the divine energy is flowing through you. Genius is, God's, is God coming through, or God energy, whatever you want to call it. And it's flowing through. Okay, so now the energy is coming through, all that energy is flowing through, and now all this energy is flowing back. Okay, everybody's appreciating it. That's energy coming to you. Now, you go off stage, what do you do with all that energy that's come to you and still comes to you as everybody's walking away thinking how wonderful you are? That's energy that comes at you. And how do you deal with that if you're not sending the energy out? Now, for me, I have to pray for hours to all the people who read my books. And my eyes, and my eyes are closed, not all the time, but sometimes I just start seeing faces. These faces, eh, who are these faces? Finally, I figure out these are all the people reading my book. <laughs> are thinking about me and think, oh, John Gray, help me. So I, all I, my meditation is I, I pull in the divine energy and I send to all the people who read my books, take my seminars. I start with my family members, whatever, then all those people. And you have to just send that energy out until your body's at peace because it's more energy than I can be using. And that, that's the whole thing to this. If you call on energy or energy's coming to you and you don't use it, then it's blocked in your body. And, but that block's good because it helps you get in touch with whatever emotions come up, you can decharge. And emotions are the most powerful way to decharge the blocked energy. Even for people who can't feel energy, uh, that's why therapy can be helpful sometimes. If it helps people get in touch with emotions as opposed to just talking about problems, actually feeling the emotion of the problem, mm, right. and then having someone listen to and connect with your emotion. What the therapist is doing then is actually pulling the energy out. If you're in pain and I feel your pain, compassion, I'm actually pulling the energy out of you, sucking it in and sending love back. So there's exchanging. And that's what the natural healers do. And a lot of the natural healers get sick. You gotta go. And 
what you kind of said before, a lot of these guys have natural talents and a lot of energy comes to them, they become popular, then the energy gets blocked. Mm -hmm. That's where the dark side of these guys comes into play. Right, That's right. what happened to Sai Baba. He did bad stuff. And uh, the, the fake Sai Baba, yeah. the one that, but people feel glorious in their presence. Okay, right. why? Because everybody's putting on a pedestal. Okay, so all the energy is going to them. So you just go in sync. It feels so good to feel devotion, to feel love, and to feel light. It's energy going out of you. And why would energy going out of you be good? Because it's the blocked energy. You're letting it go. Right. And, and they, they've learned how to suck the energy. And then oh. they can give it back. And then when they, they gave it back is through miracles. That probably explains the phenomenon of, of cult leaders, where you're, you're looking at their, their prey, their victims, you know, nefarious leaders right and you're thinking god how did those people how could those people be so gullible like who would ever fall for that this guy's obviously dark energy yes, you know but yes. that's that's what it is then they just feel so good because yeah. they've got their own dark energy it gets released right. and so you feel this oh i feel so light as a result of being around this person and they have the ability this third eye center which is they're born with it you know there's a a wonderful system of astrology called human design yeah yeah and human design you talks believe in about that it's fantastic. Oh, cool. I, you know, all these things have, uh, is how you interpret it, of course, sure. is the accuracy. But the reality is, yeah, it's clearly, um, I'm, a, I'm a, in that system, I'm a, a generator. I'm generating all the time, just generator, generator. But I'm not a manifester. So I always have everybody doing stuff for me. So I always feel <laughs> right. like I'm, you know, I got editors of it. But I generate, you know, always yeah. just give me something. I'll create something more out of it. And it's very on the track for many people yeah. but the idea of that is that we come in with these channels that are automatically open for us and there's others that aren't and we depend upon other people to have that connection so it for me there's i think <clears throat> for me for years as when i started teaching my own seminars uh, after i left maharishi and that's back to my story again but <laughs> yeah yeah i was actually going to take it back there <laughs> but, yeah but it, the um I, I had seminars around the country, and, and, but no matter what we did to promote them or not promote them, usually about 30 or 32 people came. It was like classroom size, so you don't need a mic. And that was just sort of some magical power. And I just gave up worrying about it and say, okay, this is great. I always grow. And I'm about helping other people, but growing myself. And, but what, what I realized is when I get a room of 32 people and I get people speaking the truth, then more truth comes into my awareness. And that's how I develop all my ideas is on stage. I just see it as clearly as, as can be when I've got a whole group of people. Because when you're connecting with people, everybody, if you get 32 people, all of your channels will open. Mm. If you're being open. Right. And they feel safe to open up. So my style has been always, I just completely say what's on my mind. I completely open up. I talk. I'm free. I'm vulnerable. All the pieces of me I reveal and then people can connect with me and where they connect connects, connects with me. My channel's fully open. So, you know, my meditation I do now is um, it, it took maybe 30 years to develop these ideas that I have not yet written a book on it, but they're 32 levels, 33 levels of meditation that will open up all the channels without depending on other people to open them. Not that you don't, not that I don't want to be with other people. I love giving to other people, but then right. I'm not so needy. If you right. can do it all yourself, then you come from a place of energy flowing and service. And that's sort of the ultimate goal is always selfless service. Right. But fulfillment at the same time. Wow. Well, that takes me back to the TM, Transcendental Meditation. And... I was listening to an interview with Tom Knowles. Oh, Tom's great. He's We're a friends. Vedic meditation teacher. And he was telling a story about how he eventually, I might have, you know, I'm not sure if I had it exactly right, but the essence of the story was that you had been Maharishi's assistant and, and Tom was around also. And that at a certain point, Maharishi just called him up and he was the new assistant. That's how I remember the story. Did something like that happen to... For him. That wasn't the way it was for me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll tell you the moment where it was for me. is So we were on tour in America. Yeah. Remember I mentioned I appointed myself. We were in Spain at the time. We were having big courses there. There was like 3,000 people all meditating all day long, doing classes. And, uh, and I'm his assistant at that time because I kept everybody away. <laughs> 
And then he was invited on this world, this world, this America tour of seven cities. And I did not have a lot of money. And so all of the VIP people would come and ask him, oh, can I come? He said, best to stay, best to stay. He didn't want to travel with a bunch of entourage. It's a big trouble when you're airplanes and worrying about everybody. So I got his plane ticket. So I just bought one for myself. I didn't ask. <laughs> Otherwise, he could have said best to stay. <laughs> right, right. So I didn't ask. I just bought my own ticket. But I didn't have the money. I thought, how do I get a ticket? Well, at that time, this is 1969, 1970 or something, there was this special tour ticket you could buy in Europe called Tour America for $125. Tour America, $125. And so as long as you did it in a circle all around America, and that was tour was, so I could fly with him the whole way on my little tiny budget that I had. And I had no money for food, just a little bit money left. And I didn't know where I was going to stay, but I did it anyway. And I remember when I sat next to him on the airplane, he just smiled at me. How did you get here? <laughs> but he was quiet because I think he just saw himself and me, very mm -hmm. ambitious. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we arrived and we were in the hotel. I couldn't afford these fancy hotels, but we always got him a suite. And the national leader would pay for the suite. And I was the assistant helping everything. And so I would just put him to bed. He'd go into the sleeping room and I would sleep in the, uh, the other part of the suite without anybody knowing. Mm -hmm. And I had all my suitcase in the bathroom there. And somehow in the plane, my, pa my protein powder that I was traveling with, that was my main food, was protein powder. <laughs> it had popped open in the suitcase. So I was cleaning up this mess and he walked out and he saw it. He looked at me <laughs> and just smiled and went back into his room. <laughs> so he knew I was sleeping in his room. He didn't say yeah, anything about yeah. it. And then we went to the next city the next city, that, the other assistant would now come back. He was a big shot. He said, who are you with the keys? I said, I'm the new assistant. No, you're not. Take the keys. So I gave him the keys. And, and about 30 minutes later, a messenger comes and says, Maharishi wants to see you. And he brought us both in the room. And he says, okay, I want you both to be on a schedule. And that was the first time he, he said, I'm the assistant. It was like I was the little velveteen rabbit. You know the story? Where the no, rabbit I don't, finds I don't. out he's, the little boy says the velveteen rabbit is real. Oh, okay. And he goes, I am real. You know, so okay. I just remember that moment. You know, yeah. he says, Yes, <clears throat> you're both my assistants now. He just says, And I want you on a schedule. I was so happy inside. Now I'm official. And then he said, Who wants the morning and who wants the evening? Now, that was a big moment. It, it, I thought, oh, I love the evening, then I could meditate all day and then do the evening. But that would be the easy path. I will do the difficult path. I will be disciplined. And the other guy, I said, well, I'll do the morning. He says, I'll do the afternoon. Because he's like rich, easygoing guy. And yeah. But I felt like so courageous, I'll do the, the harder job because I'm so devoted. But anyway, the point is, the next day I realized that all the instructions of the day were decided on my shift so when he came on his shift, I gave him all the instructions. Oh. So now I was the big boss. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. It was a fun time for me. And I was a good meditator. He really, you know, he, and all the TM centers, you can, I think it's still there, this, the levitation picture they have in the TM centers. They got my picture up there and my brain waves during that time. I was an exemplary meditator. And the, med the levitation was bouncing. We all thought we were going to fly with bouncing. Hmm. And you, you felt the kundalini energy. You felt enlivened by it. You felt fabulous by it. The body shake. That's all. The shaking is a stage where the energy is flowing around the blocks. Okay. So you got blocks hmm. in your body. If you can just be like this and the energy just swells out, that's because you have no blocks. But as soon as you have, it hits a block, then your body wants to shake and have the energy move around it. You can also, if you can identify that block as a feeling, a negative emotion, a limited belief form, you can then send that out of you. So, but, you know, these are all different stages of the meditative process. Shaking is a good thing if it's happening automatically. They're called kriyas. So your body just starts moving different ways. Right. And, but then you get beyond that where you can just be. Um, so what is the story, timeless. John, of, of uh, Tom Knowles and your eventual exit out of that role? Uh, Oh, my exit out of that role, which was door boy, I didn't exit. I mean, I was always, he put me in charge of every department. Uh. It's, again, when I was growing up as a kid, it seemed my mother loved me more as six brothers, <laughs> five brothers and a sister, so all these kids. 
I'm all rich and famous. And they all say, oh, but that's because mom loved you more. I said, that's ridiculous. Mom loved all of us. And they said, no, she loved you more. <laughs> so my mother was still alive. And so we went in. I said, well, let's go ask her. And she said, oh, all her children are there, seven kids. She says, oh, you know, I do everything I can to show you how much I love you equally. It's just Johnny. He makes you love him more. <laughs> I didn't know any of this as a kid. Yeah, know. yeah. They were aware of it, and they were really right. jealous of me. So they were, a lot of tormenting went on with me. They were the older ones. Uh, I'm number five. And then around the TM movement, the same thing happened. So much jealousy. And, um, you know, I w we do these meditation courses, and I would decide to, to um, not talk be in silence for a month. They all would complain to the Maharishi. He said, he's not talking. He's not talking. He says, that's okay. You can all not talk. Really? We can all practice not talking? One day they cannot talk. They're back talking. <laughs> you know, and I would fast for long times. And he was, oh, it's okay. You want to all fast? You could fast. Nobody would fast. But, uh, you know, it's very ambitious as, yeah. a, as a yogi. And uh, so he, uh, no longer being at the door with him, then I would still meet with him, and I would, he put me in charge of each of the different departments. And then the people would be really upset, who's this 23-year-old you know, being in charge of my department? You know, they were like pissed off at me. But he was wanting me, and he told me in my last conversation with him in person, I was saying, you know, what's my future gonna be, you know, in, in, in this movement? And he said, oh, one day you will own this movement. That was his phrase. I was, he was preparing me as one of the people to take over. And that was my last conversation because I left after that. And he called me looking for me and I wouldn't call back. I, I, you know, I just said, I knew that if I talked to him, it'd be kind of like saying no to my father or something. You know, I didn't want to do that. So and just, why did you decide that, that it was time for you to move on to Well, to what happened interests? for me, it was a lot of things happened. One is <clears throat> there's a... In the spiritual journey, the, the whole thing is I'm s attracted to my guru, Maharishi, like a magnet because something over there is what's inside of me. Mm. And I want to find that. And through my meditations, became very, very advanced. Um, and I did have various things happen, but not the bhavudi. I would have beings come to me and take me around the universe. And I, at that time, it was, I did have this one... I'm looking at a clock for five minutes and I'm not breathing. Uh, I went into a breathless state then and, and uh, I'm just watching it go around and around, you know. It went to three minutes, then it went to five minutes, holy. But then it felt like this huge spaceship was landing, big black cloud was coming. I said, maybe I'm dying. <laughs> so I decided not to ever do that again. And that was induced breathlessness through long hours of pranayama, breathing exercises, where your body sucks up, sucks up, and your tongue goes up in here and you're... You go in the state and you're just looking like, oh my God, I'm not breathing. Now I don't have to do any of that stuff. I do it energetically and I'm in this place. It's practice, you know, it takes mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. but every, at every, the great news, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm aware nobody listening can just jump into that, you know, but it's every step of the path is very fulfilling. And, but there's this, there's this uh, thing for me after nine years of being with Maharishi, suddenly I didn't feel that magnetic pool and it was the last year I was around him he was uh, people would always come to me and say what would Marishi say about this and I would give an answer and what would Marishi say about this and I, I was like an authority of what Marishi would say and I was great at telling these stories of Marishi and what he would do what he would say and so forth and people would line up outside his door and 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 Marishi would say go out and help them uh consolidate their question because we want to just go talk he said go get it down so when they come in my room you ask the question for them then it doesn't waste time you know he was like what is the question so i got very good at getting people to the point bringing him in hearing his answer then he would <laughs> then he would say okay you go out find the questions i bring him in he said okay you know the answers go tell them <laughs> so then i would go out and tell them the answers really yeah so i became like really well known for having the answers, what, right, Mar right. what Marishi would say. Okay, right, Marishi right. would say this. And people loved it because, you know, now I tell stories about myself. They're fun stories. I used to tell all these stories about him. People loved it. They felt closer mm -hmm. to him that way. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit of a celebrity, and some people were jealous of me. Some people loved me, just like it is now. So th then what happened is uh, the magnet, it just, I didn't feel it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, but, I, but I felt like for those last few months, People would ask me, what would Marcy say about this? And I said, or they would say, what about this? And I would say, some answer. 
And they would say, did Marshi say that? I said, no. <laughs> so these answers were naturally coming out of me. And just it became clear as day what a good answer would be. And it wasn't always with him. And then I started finding these answers coming out of me that were a little bit in conflict with what he would say. So that was happening. So it was more like my voice now. In a sense, I had gotten my master's degree, which was I can copy. That's what a master's degree is, is when you master some body of knowledge that other people developed. Mm -hmm. Then PhD is where you develop your own knowledge. That's where you have your own original work. So I had to leave the master to develop my PhD, so to speak. Didn't know that. I just knew that I didn't feel that draw. And my brother, Jimmy, was bipolar, and he'd come to live with me, hoping that TM could, and I was in Europe with Maharishi, that the meditation would help him. It didn't. And um, he wanted me to help him. So I had a choice. I could continue being this celebrity in the TM movement and meditating, or I could go help my brother. So I decided I would go study psychology and came throughout this California to study psychology to learn something that might help my brother. Wow. And, and there's a lot of pieces in there. I'm yeah, not, you know, yeah, It's yeah, a big yeah. story, but that yeah. was really the gist of it is, is to help my brother. And then when I started studying psychology, I was also homeless for a while. I had no money. I just, you know, grace comes to me always. So I'm sitting there going, well, my car broke down. My, I had this old car. I'm driving around, but then it broke down. What do I do, you know? <laughs> I'm waiting for like the angel to appear <laughs> and nothing happened you know I'm on the beach and, and it's cold it's Santa Monica Beach but it's cold at night and there's a lot of homeless people there and it's scary and on some nights we go get a hotel room and I'm sitting there half the people are just released from a mental hospital you know this is and I was like God have you forsaken me <laughs> what is this right. you know and but it, it was it was I was in an ecstatic state of God consciousness where everything was God but at the same time it was scary so there were two, these two aspects happening together. And, and I'm sitting around the fire one night, and the guy said to me, you know, John, have a beer. I said, no, I don't drink. And he said, no, you should have more fun. I said, no, no, I have, I'm enjoying myself. I love to teach to you. And they said, well, we'd love to listen to you too, but we have no idea what you're talking about. And that was like a hammer dropped, and I learned one of the most important lessons of my life. You can't be everything to everybody, and that these people weren't my audience. That I'm here to be of service, but this wasn't my audience. There's plenty of people who are my audience, and I need to find them or let them find me. And I've, this is like a big theme in my life that's brought so much peace to me. Because so many people, there's so many problems in the world. You know, the, 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 the bad water, the, the global warming, the bad politics, the bad this, the bad this. The, so many places. You can't do it all. You find you what you can do. If I could do it all, you wouldn't have a job. Yeah, right. Nobody could do anything. We, right. you know, we, we complain, you know, we're the ones who are supposed to solve the problem. And so you find your way. So it gives me huge peace because there's so many different things that I want to help. But I have to go, well, well, here I'm helping a lot with this by bringing more love into the world. That's my gift, helping people understand each other and have more love. I probably will write some more books on this advanced meditation, but it's really more about opening your heart anyway. But that's really the key. That makes absolute perfect sense. And obviously yeah. you stumbled across something that you're really good at because of the immense success you've had in the genre of helping people relate. Yeah, yeah. Which I think, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, you know, it's one is more impactful than the other, but still the act of learning how to meditate and explore consciousness is still by and large a solo expedition. Whereas in relationship, if people can create a conscious relationship as you teach and if they decide to have offspring and that relationship is then modeled for their kids right then you would think that their kids would eventually evolve probably to have conscious relationships and so on and so on which is probably more of a mushroom effect you know in the long I term think, i think they're both very very important i you know yeah. i don't i don't I mean, I guess it's not one or the other. It's I guess it's just, other. it's, your, it's your, your path ended up path. also being yeah. hugely impactful. Yes. I mean, it has yeah. been in my life. I mean, I listen to your, I still listen to your shit all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Because I'm Thank just you. like, God, I got to figure this thing out. You know, I want to get along with said partner. And, you know, there's definitely fundamental differences between the male and female brain and hormonal systems and all the things that you teach and more and communication and everything. And getting an understanding of that, um, I'm sure has made me a much better person and a partner. 
I want to touch on one thing. Um, this is, it's so funny. We ended up really spending the whole time talking about all of this, which has been fascinating. And I, as usual, I have like three pages of notes that we're probably not going to touch on. We'll do it at another time. Um, but I, I'd like for people to know, cause I get this question a lot. Um, and you would probably have some historical reference here of how TM kind of became this organization. And then certain people such as a Tom Knowles seem to have broke off and really have taught and shared the same essential practice of a mantra based meditation, calling it Vedic meditation, which I learned many years ago from my teacher, Jeff Kober out in LA. And I practice it every day still. It just, once I learned, got my mantra stuck. It's such a great program. There's right? nothing, there's nothing I would do, but people always go, well, what's the difference between TM and Vedic? And I don't really know, except the organizational principles of how the teachers operate seems to be different. Do you have anything That's you could? The same technique. It's That's the same thing. It's just what, which one you resonate with. Got it. Um, one's I think Tom's is cheaper, uh, but they're both quality programs, very right. quality programs. Uh, TM is a really good introduction to the whole thing. And I, I talk to people who've been doing, I've been doing it 50 years. I mean, I meditate 50 years. Uh, I don't do the TM technique because it's an earlier stage of the process. It's, it's learning to create samadhi. You repeat a mantra. Okay, a mantra is a resonant frequency. Okay, so there's these called uh, bija mantras. They're um, like ring, 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 and something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you repeat that over and over. What happens is when you repeat something over and over, it becomes effortless, like driving and shifting gears when we used to do that. You know, you would just, it's automatic. You don't think. You, so you get into this automatic. So now you're getting in touch with, well, what's doing it is intention. Okay, so you're strengthening your intention because in the beginning, for a lot of people, not everybody, it's very boring. So you have to strengthen, you have to, okay, you got one thing, you're just repeating this mantra over and over. And yeah, your mind's going to wander. Now what Maharishi brought to the tech table, which wasn't commonly taught in India, is concentration. You should concentrate. You should try hard to concentrate. Now when I meditate, I'm in a deep concentration trance. There's no thought. It's just whatever my intent is. And I usually meditate on love or something, but it could be other things too, serving. But, but and you, you, you concentrate, you're just there. It's easy, but it's always easy because I built up to that. So what was taught in India is what the, the great gurus would do is because they do it all the time, they're fiercely concentrating, concentrating. And if you do that long enough, you end up to be able to do it easily. Like a ballet dancer would discipline himself. Very hard to do. But then you see him on stage and it looks so easy. And then go home and try it. <laughs> it's not. So Maharishi brought the idea for the Westerners, which was brilliant. And this is really the distinction is you repeat the mantra and don't put effort into it. Let it be effortless. Effort and, let, and just your whole focus is to notice when you're off the mantra and then easily come back, just like any other thought. Notice how easy it is to think. You don't have to do anything. Now with a little intention, think the mantra. Think in the mantra. Oh, notice you're off. Effortlessly come back. So the power is training your brain to come back by effortlessly coming back, effortlessly coming back. So he taught people to do that. And that, that's the first stage, is now you're repeating and it's effortless. So now you, when something's effortless, you begin to notice more. Yeah, what am I doing here? I'm not doing anything. I mean, if we just did this, I'm moving my finger up and down, try it. You just move your finger and look at it. In the beginning, you were doing it, but then you look at it long enough, you kind of go, I'm not doing that. How are you doing it? See, how are we doing it? We just had an intention and it does it. Okay, so this is how the world is really. We just mm -hmm. intend, but we think we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So you just keep repeating it, repeating it. And what happens then is then you start, the mind starts to notice the gap between the two mantras. Ding, ding. There's a gap in between. And the gap is where that sound came from. That's the self. So who's, mm. who's, who's thinking? Okay, where's that coming from? The mind goes, oh, there's a space in between. It just naturally happens. Your mind will start being drawn into that space. At that point, the second stage is you're sort of feeling like you're witnessing and now you start to feel like the, the mantra is coming out of you. See, it's coming out of that space. So it's no longer the space is following between mantras. Now the space is there and mantras are coming out of it. And then the third stage, this is samadhi. One's called uh, uh, dharana, that's focus. 
mantra, mantra. Dhyan is is a flow. Everybody's talking about the flow today. You know, that's right. now I'm just witnessing, and the, everything's just coming out of me, coming out of me. So that's a regular meditation, 20 minutes twice a day. It's amazing program that gets answers people's questions and inspires them to continue doing it shows the benefits of it you know so there's a clear intention you know that's really important you have to know why am i doing this you know get a little dopamine into it that this is what you're going to have this is what's going to result and it will you know i look at my life everything you know all these wonderful things happen and they said they would you know but you have to connect with the source of that thought okay so now you have this whole model for understanding it the tm model but second stage is now you got to flow. And then the third stage is if that mantra is flowing out of me, then that mantra is already in me. And that's samadhi. That's where everything becomes more peaceful. Now you just, everything's inside of you. And it becomes more of a stream. Okay, then, then what you have is then you do all three together at the same time, and that's called sanyama. And that's his cities program as you practice doing sanyama, which is you could think of something like happiness, and feel happier. You know, some people can think happy and they don't notice anything. But if you can do all those things together, <laughs> you, your mind locks into it. You think happiness, you feel happy. You think grateful. Then your mind starts more effortlessly feeling grateful, strong. You know, you start feeling strong. I want to do something. You know, so that you basically can increase the potency of anything you think about. Okay, so for me, for oh, what must have been a good every day for hours when men are from mars after i wrote it i meditated for hours men are from mars when we're from venus number one best-selling book in the world men are from mars when we're from venus number one best-selling book in the world men are from mars when we're from venus number one best-selling book in the world stayed on the bestseller list number one number two almost four and a half years five years on the new york times it's still in china hundreds of millions of people buy that book it's just it's Isn't crazy it the, the Biggest selling relationship book of all time? Yes. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, because you go into any, well, they don't have bookstores anymore, but go on Amazon, I guess, and well, you know, look it, up relationship book, and there's thousands of them. You well, know what I mean? It, it always, so. it's, it would be much higher, except they don't rate the thousands of books they sell every week, which are for a dollar. You can buy all my books for a dollar because they're all used. I mean, there's millions right. of my books, you know, 50 right, million right. books out there. People get them from libraries, you know, and they sell them online. Sure. So you get these $1 books, $2 books. So it's, I'm happy with that. I mean, that's, that's great. I'm glad the yeah. books, it just continues. I do a lot of work in China now because uh, China's a big country and I, they, it's expanding and they, they also really need it as well. Mm -hmm. In America, a lot of people feel, oh yeah, we know that guy, we know that guy. It was big in the 90s, so to speak. In the 90s, yeah. it was, um, USA Today said it was the, of all the books, nonfiction, paperback, hardback, whatever, biggest seller of the decade. And it was uh, of all the books. Wow. Yeah, it was a big seller. It that's was, a, that's madness. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I remember in the 90s, it was a book that I was aware of, but I was in no state to have a relationship with them right. that yeah. was meaningful in any way. But it was like, it was the book that older people used that's to right. get better relationships. That's, right. that's you how know? it's seen by the younger generation. But yeah. when they see it, but they kind of go, whoa, this is up, this yeah, is me. Yeah, well, after you know? I, I think, I forget, I forget, I've read your book or heard you talk first. I think I might've heard you speak. And I was like, well, I remember that book. It's this yeah. guy. I'm like, this right. guy's on point. You know, right. I went back, right. of course, to read the book. I have the audio book and a bunch of your other books. Mm on audio and I'm like I don't care like when you were born this stuff applies you know it's universal knowledge it is yeah and you know I do a, because I do a lot of work in China I'm exposed to a lot of the Taoist philosophy of yin and yang sure could speak their language there and it's um, it's very in tune with that you know the the if you go to the Tibetan places and whatever you know they see these big things always the gods are the male and female having sex you know, that's like the highest thing. And what that is, that's the symbol, if not actually happening, but the symbol of the male and female coming together. And that's what's happening today in the world is the every, the, the, your generation and younger generations, they have greater access to spirit, whether they're meditating or not. So they will, they will progress their meditation much faster than we did in those days. And the greater access to spirit means, oh, I have all the female qualities or I have access to them. I have access to all the masculine qualities. Okay, so which am I? And, but you've got this body, which is uh, if you've got the hormone system of a male, that has to be honored. 
you always, if you, if you express too many of your feminine qualities, if you're a man, we'll say emotion. Emotion is yin energy, that's feminine. Detachment is masculine energy, analysis. Now the Buddha primarily taught to men who did meditation. Go to India, nobody, the women generally don't meditate at all. Oh, that's very hard for women, men do it. And he taught it primarily for men. His followers were mainly men when it came to meditation. Not that there weren't some women. And the whole idea is it was helpful to men because you're able to forget your problems. Well, that's the Mars Venus book. That's the cave. Women, right. you gotta cave understand, time. it's cave time. <laughs> men need to do whatever it takes that yeah. you think is a waste of time is anything that will help him to forget his problems. It's a distraction. Yeah. Learning about cave time has helped me immensely, not only in communicating that to a partner, but just knowing that I need that. For example, I used to come home, I was in one relationship and I used to come home and, uh, and my girlfriend would just want to hear everything about my day and want to tell me about her day right when I walked in the door. Right. And I was so, it was so irritating to me. And so I would just kind of, you know, get away from her and go off and even meditate or do whatever. And then she'd resent it. She'd get so pissed off. She's like, you don't care. You're emotionally unavailable, this and that. And I didn't understand what was happening. I just knew, especially if we had been out in a very busy day yeah. and I was being very proactive and then we came home. I just like, okay, I need to get away from you for a while, and from everyone, not just her. Yeah. Get away from people. Yeah. Be by myself. Do whatever. Just sit and obsess on my phone or anything. Anything. To yeah. Forget whatever you're responsible for in your life. And yeah. that, you know, a long time ago, even in America, if you had a resume in 1950, you'd always put your hobbies, because right. hobbies are basically anything which is a waste of time. <laughs> right. That you right. like to do. Right. Okay. Right. But that's ideal for men to forget their problems. Right. And that's what meditation is. It's forgetting everything. It's letting go. Once I, le once I learned that principle from you, then I would start to communicate that. Like, hey, just so you know, when, when I come home from a thing, you know, I'd, I would indicate that that was a need of mine and say, yeah, I do not want you to take it personally. It has nothing to do with you. I just, I need that time to decompress. And it's been really successful to be able to communicate that. Oh, it makes it so easy. So then your partner I... understands and they're like, oh, he's doing his thing. Okay, he's yeah. cave thing. Men yeah. Are, he's from Mars. Men are, we're different. Yeah, and yeah. then they become habituated to that and understanding of that and I just go do my thing and I come back a much better man. Yeah. Because I took 20 minutes, hour or whatever and just went and just zoned out. You know? yeah, and and I'll, I'll, let me expand cave to the Beyond Mars and Venus book. If ever you get in an argument, what happens is man will tend to instinctively want to back out. Just, this is a waste of time. I'm out of this. She will engage him and pull him back in with questions. She'll follow him. And that's really where a lot of the bad stuff happens mm. is when he doesn't get his time to pull away. And he needs to learn how to do that. But she needs to learn also to not want to engage. Because whenever you have conflict, here's a couple who love each other. Connection is fulfillment. And conflict is separation. She just wants to connect. But at that time, connection is not the right thing you need to do with him. He needs to detach. And now we know that go to the cave, forget his problems, feel good, then come back. Now we understand hormonally, which is beyond Mars and Venus, when a man starts to engage in an argument, his testosterone levels are converting into estrogen, emotion. Yeah. He's starting to get defensive, argumentative. And emotion in men only arises, negative emotion, when there's a cortisol response happening in his body. He's, he's getting in a defensive posture. When you're in a defensive posture like that, blood flow stops to the front part of the brain where you can actually hear another person's point of view. You become attached to your Oh, I, I know. You just, you can't, you have to just get, she can't hear anything from you. And, yeah. and what you're going to say is not coming from your heart either. And you got to stop it. And I remember the yeah. day with Bonnie, my wife, Bonnie, when I did this the first time, I said, look, I, I need, we need to stop talking. I need to take some time and we'll talk again. And I walked away. And I could just feel her, oh, he's leaving me again, you know, that sort of, you feel guilty, you've hurt them, you've run away from them, whatever. But when I came back, she thanked me, and she said, John, thank you so much for taking that time so we could center ourselves. I really felt safe, I feel safer now. <laughs> wow, so that freed me from this guilt thing that right. men also have put on them for wanting to take their time. Because right. it, it does hurt a woman, she feels, uh, if she doesn't understand it, you know, if she thinks you're leaving me as opposed to, no, I'm coming to my cave so I can come back and give you more, and I can't do that right now. And sometimes women will say to me, well, why can't he do that? I say, I just imagine your husband's in a wheelchair. Now, you can't say, well, if you love me, you'll walk. 
You just can't say that. Well, you've got a man, it's his biology. If he gets upset, he can't be loving. He needs to take alone time. He needs to disconnect, which increases testosterone, which is what meditation was for. It was to help men and keep their, when they're not feeling good enough, their testosterone goes down and then they feel emotional and get angry and irritable and grumpy and all that stuff. That's a male going out of balance. So if he can have meditation, he can do something he's good at. He just does it. It's real simple to do. You just do it and do it and do it. Your mind becomes quiet. You forget your problems. But you have to have the intent to forget your problems. You can't just, your mind will start molding it over and you go, no, that's a waste of time. It's mm -hmm. amazing what intention can do. If you just say, look, that happened. It's not good to think about it now. Forget it. And the problem today is so many psychology, many people in psychology will say, no, no, you should process it. You should process it. No, don't process it until you're feeling good. Right. When you're feeling good, then process it. Yeah, because when you, when you feel good and you can come back, you have, I find, an ability to be more objective about the whole scenario and especially what I might have done to create. Contribute to the problem. Yeah. That's not just objectivity. That's accountability. Okay. Because yeah. when I'm upset, my mind just goes to mashed potatoes. And it blames. And it blames. Yeah. yeah. And then there's there, no resolution is going to happen because I'm either offensive or defensive. And it's just a, a trap. Right. But if I can go away and I go, ah, oh, you know what? I was being kind of a jerk back there at the restaurant. Let me own that. I can go back in and say, hey, listen, I'm sorry. And also the thing you did, you know, and assume responsibility and also be able to communicate my needs in a way that's healthier and if isn't it's accusatory. Done, if, it, if, it's, if it's done without a demand, the whole key is asking for what you like by sharing preferences. This is what I would have liked to happen. And uh, would you like, you want to know what I would like for you to have done or said, let them, don't push it on them. Anytime you right. see the whole thing that destroys relationships and our life is when we, we push and we want to change it, force it to change. And it's, it's no, no more, more dramatic than an intimate relationship. You start out, you find someone that actually loves you and you love them and it's like so good, then you want to now change them. And that's like the ultimate insult. But, it, but we do it. And men do it with emotions. You know, all of our monkey emotions, okay, they're like these automatic reactions or manipulation. Just take it as that. That's what it is. If you're afraid, you're trying to get out of something. If you're angry, you're wanting to intimidate. You should do this for me. Oh, I'm afraid I don't have to do that. Now you're getting out of something. If you're, you're sad, you're eliciting compassion, empathy to get more support. There are primitive ways to get people to do things for you. So when we don't know what to do to get what we want, the brain reverts back to this instinctive conditioning and that we also learn from our parents as well to some oh, extent. Oh, that's interesting. It's to get your needs met. So in other words, if you don't have the understanding of how to communicate, to know what your needs are and have that awareness, then to communicate said needs, then your default's going to be just the animal way of like getting your needs that's met, right. That's which right. is really like bull in a china shop to a relationship. That's right. And, right. and, and men have the advantage here, mm, which is to recognize we have an easy route to objectivity because we get rewarded for it. Because the dominant hormone in our body is testosterone. We need 10, 20 times, 30 times more than a woman. So when we detach, we actually get a reward for it. Our, our, our testosterone goes up and we can do it much more easy than women. Women find their detachment or their centeredness by first sharing what comes up. So if they can share those monkey emotions, and when I say monkey, I don't, and, don't mean to be demeaning. We could say childlike feelings, their emotions, their reactions. They yeah. just react automatically, these automatic reactions. If she can talk about her emotions with somebody who empathizes with her, they just, the energy releases. And we're back to this whole idea of how you actually do energetic healing is you pull energy out of people, blocked energy. Well, when somebody empathizes with you, your energy flows to them. And because they're coming from a place of caring, the caring goes back in and there's a healing that happens by sharing. Now for men, the healing primarily happens by detaching, coming back into balance. Then if you still have emotions, you can share them, but you'll be doing it in a heartfelt, non-demanding way. There's a guy, I think his name's Ken Kais, back in the 60s, wrote a book, always did, a whole book just talking about giving up demands and living in a world of preferences. Hmm. See, and, and what is the distinction? I'd really like this. If it works, that's great. Okay, there's no push behind it. A demand is I want this, and if I don't get it, I'm going to be unhappy. 
And that's what the Buddha taught, which is don't be attached to the outcome. You can share what you want, but you don't get it. That's still okay, you know, because really the, the major source of happiness is we have to be happy. And it's very funny. I'll talk to any audience and I'll say, now, whose job is it to be happy? Everybody says, mine, mine. I said, yeah, everybody feels that way until they get married. And then they blame their partner for not making them happy. Right. Yeah, they get, this is, if you're a successful person in business, I say, oh, why are you not successful? It's your fault. The losers are always blaming the system, blaming somebody else. And yeah, that's valid. You can't find fault with everything. But if you want to be successful, you need to be accountable for creating your life. And that's this whole idea of you create your reality. And this is a new age thought. And there's a little glitch in that one, which is people say, what about these children? And they, they get abused, they get mistreated. Did they create their life? My perspective, simple answer to that, is you only create your life if you create your life. See, I create my life. And what that means is that when something happens, I go, how did I create that? How did I contribute to that? What did I say? Why did I pick my, park my car here where that happened? Why did I go and do that? What was my feeling? And did I have a little hunch that maybe I shouldn't do that? Or what was my little greedy desire in there wanting to right. take? You know, where, do some self-introspective and you'll realize that every time you go off track and don't get what you want, there was a, there was a way you could have avoided that. And if there wasn't, then you're not self-aware. So if you're not self-aware, you don't create your life. It's just happening to you. The universe is happening to you. Now, that's the answer to that. So yeah, nobody creates their life until they're 100% accountable for everything that happens, which means there's absolutely no drop of victim inside of you. And every negative emotion is victim. Now what that means is that you can embrace, you're still gonna have this monkey brain, a big portion of our brain is like a monkey's, their emotions are going to happen, so that's a reaction, but you don't use those emotions to change others, you use those emotions to change yourself. So that's the secret of how women can communicate to men without men uh, getting argumentative, which is, I just want to talk about this, it's not a big deal. That's a million Ooh. dollar phrase. <laughs> I can yeah. already, if you preface it that way, I'm like, oh, I can listen to you now. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. It's like, yeah. it's a million dollar phrase. That's it's not amazing. a big deal. It's not a big deal. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so all, and then women, women always <laughs> times up. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. All right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a million dollar phrase. It's not a big deal. If women learn that and that women walk away, but they always will say, what if it is a big deal? I say, okay, yeah, we're always going to bring up he cheated on you and it's a big deal. Then you tell him, this is a big deal. Let's go get help. Right. Because he cannot going to hear it if you just dump it on him. And what's interesting, if the issue is a big deal in a man's mind, he'll be very attentive. But so many of the issues that women talk about to him are things that he would go, well, no big deal, no big deal. And so he, let's analyze why that <laughs> distinction is there. Oh, that's so I, good. I, I read this research. So true, One time man. on moderate stress levels in a man or woman, okay, traffic, deadlines, pressure, forgot to do this, got to clean up the house. Okay, this is the moderate stress of life, overwhelm kind of thing. What happens in a woman's brain? Blood flow to the emotional part of the brain, to the hippocampus where the emotional memory is, increases eight times under moderate stress. For men, it decreases. Is okay. that why we go brain dead when we're stressed out? That's why we will tend to detach. Ah, okay. The first thing, imagine you're talking to your girlfriend and like, is she upset with me? Is she not? Right that moment, you've just detached. You know, is there danger? Is there not? Is this a big deal? Is this not? So what you'll tend to do is detach to think about it, to analyze it, to figure out what am I going to do about this? Because when you're thinking, what am I going to do about that? That's being accountable. I got, I got the solution. I got to find my solution. So men will tend to detach under moderate stress. And women will tend to become more emotional and more attached. They want to connect at that time. And their emotions magnify based upon their childhood conditioning. And a million years as monkeys. Okay, it will magnify. And so she has this need to talk and to express to be heard. And he has a need to be quiet and to think. So right in the middle of a conversation, women will start to panic because you're thinking too much. You're analyzing what she says. And, th and, then <laughs> and, and then they get all flustered inside. So here's another million dollar phrase from my daughter, Lauren, who also teaches this stuff on my website. And she, she with her partner, she says, when he pulls away like that, she goes, oh, you're thinking about it. 
And he says, yes. Immediately the connection's back. Hmm. All you need there's is there's understanding. There's there. a connection. His, yeah. she, she, she needs reassurance because he's pulling away. And women need reassurance a lot in life. And men have to understand that because we are like rubber bands. Another Mars Venus idea. We get close. When we get close, we feel love and connection. That increases estrogen. Too much estrogen, too much connection lowers testosterone. Our well-being is based on testosterone primarily. So we have to detach from estrogen land. Testosterone comes up by doing something we're good at, solving a problem, being quiet, winning. wasting time, winning, winning anything, any, anything, yeah. anything you do that's successful. Sure. Your, your testosterone will come up. <laughs> then you suddenly start missing her again because once testosterone comes up, it's out of balance. He wants to bring in the estrogen again. So the love comes in. So that's the dance. That's the rubber band theory, which is men get close, women pull away. Well, John, we've got, we've got people knocking, and it seems like the wine is flowing out there. <laughs> and you know I could go on with you forever. You're one of the only guests that can go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Like, I could talk to you for 10 hours straight and probably never even take a breath. But I do have uh, one closing question here. And you can, you know, answer this one with great speed, probably. But who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that our audience might be able to go learn from as well? Well, um, autobiography of a yogi, uh, Yogananda. Mm -hmm. uh, my teacher, Maharishi, a TM course. Uh, brilliant, brilliant teacher and a great person. And when it comes to my work, which is gender differences, and understanding men and women and how to have loving relationships. Uh, Warren Farrell has written a book. Uh, it's called, um, he's written many books, but one of them is called uh, Why Men Are the Way They Are. So uh, this is really helpful for men. He's often considered the father of the men's movement. Really? Oh, uh, I need to get that. Uh, it's a really excellent book. He really explains in a way that many men you know, when I talk about the cave, for example, men go, yeah, that's me, okay. So that's like a surface thing. He goes very, very deep into what we are as men, what we've done always, and how today we're not seen as the noble beings that we are. If you look throughout history, we will, we're the ones who gave our lives. We're the ones who did the dirty jobs, the dangerous jobs, the difficult jobs, in service to the women and our children. And we're noble beings. And, you know, every group of people, there's always going to be a few bad apples. And sure. there's too much emphasis on the bad apples and not the good guys. I agree. And Thank you for not being politically correct and stating that fact. <laughs> <laughs> We're at a place in culture right now where men are, are very demonized because of the few bad apples. Yeah, and I'm always yeah. like, hey, over here, yeah. me and all my friends and most of my guests yeah, are pretty conscious <laughs> guys. We're doing good stuff in the world, you know, even the white ones, okay? Like... <laughs> The problem is some of the bad guys do the same things as the good guys, like go to their cave. So let's say a woman's with a bad guy. He goes to his cave. She thinks now any guy that goes to his cave is going to be a bad guy. Wow. So there's a confusion there because the bad guys still do a lot of these guy things because they're guys. Right. But actually, they're overly feminized. That's the weird thing. They're more emotional. They, they get angry. They want to fight. They want to be cruel. They want to be mean. That's estrogen in their body. That's like a, in the Beyond Mars and Venus book, a major takeaway revelation for men, which is when we're angry, it's not masculine. It's only when we lose control. See, masculine is, I'm in control. I got this. You know, it's that big paint statue of David. He's holding, he's got his slingshot. He's checking out the giant. He says, I got this. You know, that's pure masculinity. I got this. And uh, come on. And, it's when you're angry, you're losing your masculinity, you're losing your power, you're becoming a powerless person, insecure person, and every man wants to be powerful. That's who we are. We are masculinity is power, femininity is love, and we are a mixture of both. And when we, when we have too much of the imbalance, that's where all the dysfunctions come out of men and the dysfunctions come out of women. And it's never just one side. It's always both sides. And sometimes the side is you made the wrong pick because you're out of balance. You know, I'm not going to say there aren't real victims in this world. There are. Sure. But after you've been, been a victim, you come back to, okay, how was I accountable for that? How could I avoid that? How can I avoid that next time? Where was I not looking? There were, there were signs, there were tells, and I didn't see them. And now I will see them. And there's a better way to do it. And then you don't feel like a victim anymore. 
but when I talk about the emotions as being sort of this monkey-like thing, they're also the doorway to the soul. Okay? It's the soul telling you that your thinking is wrong. And emotional pain is a part of both men and women. It's just we process it differently. And when a man can take his time to let go of the, uh, what's bothering him, then he can feel his pain, but his heart is open and there's always a lesson in it, which is how did I contribute to this? How can I solve this? But, um, Amazing, dude. Yeah, yeah. Tell us where we can find your work online. Oh, so that's great. And we didn't even get to the nutrition I stuff. Know, <laughs> dude. It's, it's so <laughs> funny. Literally, I have three pages of notes because I love your, your, your site, Mars, MarsVenus.com, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'll just say it for you. But you have... What, one thing that's really cool about your work is that you're really into nutrition and like what we now call biohacking, but you yep. also do all this work in psychology and personal development and relationships. And so what, one of my favorite things about your site, and I kind of mirrored this in a sense, is you have all of your teachings, but then you also have this great store, store of all of these nutritional supplements and stuff, some of which you make and some of which are just your favorites. And I did that too, because people cool. always ask me, like, well, what's your what's your favorite thing for this and for that? And I'm like, I finally I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna put links to it all on my site. And your site is a really great resource, not only for these types of teachings, but also your store is amazing. Like the lithium orotate. Yeah, let's talk to one minute on yeah, that. Yeah, no, one. go ahead. Hey, uh, just because I'm walking up here. <laughs> okay. I'm, wa I'm walking in here for the interview. And let's this guy, do it. This guy walks up to me and says, John, you're John. You're, can I touch you? <laughs> he says, I'm your fan. I said, well, thank you. And he says, I watched your video. I saw you talking about lithium orotate. Changed my life. Changed my life. This is something I've been promoting for 18 years. Lithium orotate. And it's a... Uh, lithium is given to bipolar patients. I learned about it because my brother was bipolar, as I mentioned before. That's right, yeah. And what the doctors give for schizophrenia is lithium carbonate. Now, lithium carbonate in a very high dose will take away the symptoms of schizophrenia. But it will have side effects of taking 500 times the dose of a salt that your body needs. So imagine you had five time, 500 times or 100 times the dose of magnesium. You die of, magne of dehydration and, and diarrhea. If you had salt 100 times the dose your body needs, you'd have a heart attack. So anything in those high doses is going to have side effects. So everybody's afraid of lithium because psychiatrists give lithium carbonate in high doses. A German doctor, Dr. Nieper, discovered that he could bind the mineral with a delivery system that's more efficient, which is a substance in mother's milk. And that, that, that delivery system, you can take just a little bit, four and a half milligrams, tiny, tiny bit of lithium, a mineral like salt and whatever, bind it to erratic acid, it will cross the blood-brain barrier and the body can utilize it. It's something the brain needs to balance our mood. It doesn't suppress mood at all, it balances mood. And when you take it, you don't even notice so much that anything happened, you just notice you're not repeating your thoughts and you're not feeling anxious and a lot of the stuff that's not you just disappears. And I won't say it does it all, but there's a lot of people who are like trying to have more love in their life, they're eating better and doing good stuff, but they're still not getting the results. Mm -hmm. And often it's because they've depleted themselves of the lithium and the body can't come back into balance. And then there's all these, and remember it's the lithium orotate. Right. And rarely do people talk about this because there's no profit in it. It's the cheapest thing you could buy online, you know. It's right. like $8 for a three-month supply of this stuff. There's just no money in it to pay for marketing or whatever. But, you know, I do this also just to teach the information. So it's, it's such a good product that everybody should know about. And, and you don't hear about it. And you, people just go, why could something be so good? And also, it's not a drug. It doesn't create an altered state. It has no side effect at all. But if you were to take anything in massive doses, like the whole bottle, you'll get a stomachache. Sure. That's pretty it. Sure. And, and you wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah, like I like it. I remember hearing you talk about it, and I started ordering off your site. Actually, I'm out of it right now. But it's one of the things I take all the time. It's kind of it, in my top ten. You it's, know? A, it's such an easy one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I also have at the site the, um, the Superfood Shake. I'll just briefly talk about Oh, yeah, about yeah. It. Tell, it's, tell it's, them about the enzyme okay, thing. That okay. was fascinating. Okay, so if you, if there's studies that have been done, if you get a soy shake or a protein shake or a whey protein shake or steak even or chicken, your, your body only utilizes, it only can digest about 25% of the protein. Okay. The rest gets turned into nitrogen. It, a lot of it gets converted into sugar, by the way. But, but you're, they have a test by measuring your breath how much of the amino acids were produced, so how much you digested. So what I have is a dairy shake, and dairy is so good for the brain development. 
mother's milk is how we develop so it's cow milk and cow milk is toxic to the body to a certain extent because it's not human milk it doesn't have the right balance what cow milk has is 90 percent casein and 10 percent whey protein now that much casein is hard to digest so people are having more and more difficulty digesting milk so most people stay away from the milk products but casein makes dopamine casein has all the amino acids to make dopamine and whey protein has the amino acids to make serotonin. So you're getting your super brain fuel from getting both the casein and the whey protein, but you need in a human balance, which is about equal amounts of both. Men need a little more dopamine, so they get uh, more, more, in the men's shake, they have more casein, less whey. Women have more whey, less casein, depending on muscle mass. Okay, so you get the right balance. You still can't digest it fully, even though it's the right balance. So what, it ha what I've done is I put these enzymes in it, and, and minerals to activate the enzymes. And you put two scoops of the powder, you add room temperature water, no ice, and you let it sit for 45 minutes. It cooks itself. It bubbles, little bubbles popping up. And you drink it, and it goes right into your brain. And we had the test done, and it's over 92% absorbed by your body. Wow, instantly. that's crazy. Because it's pre-digested for you. Right, and you wouldn't get the same effect just by pounding a bunch of enzymes. No, no, you, well, the because it's not time. You're gonna, yeah. your body's gonna start digesting those enzyme pills and said protein shake way faster than the enzymes in your stomach that you just took exogenously could ever do exactly. outside of your body. And we know that. Because so it's like pre-digest. It's like how a bird, a mother bird, will take and pre-digest food and like spit it back out kind of, right? A new way of looking at my I shit. Mean, it's, yeah, I was like, <laughs> no, I'm I like horrible for your marketing. <laughs> but um, no, it's, but, it's the but, same idea though. Like something, it's a preparation where now we can assimilate it much easier. Yeah, it's not just, the, I mean, if you just drank the shake and a lot of people do, they'll take the powder, put water, put ice. It's still good as any other shake. It has a better balance of their whey, whey and casein. But still the casein is hard to digest. You gotta let it sit for 30, 45 minutes and that casein will digest and it's fuel for the brain. It's like the best, it's the best. That's so, so cool. Yeah. I didn't even know that, uh, the neurotransmitter relationship there. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, big time. That's big time. so cool. Yeah. Especially I need extra dopamine because I'm so addicted to my iPhone that I think I'm very depleted on it on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm working on it, but this thing, woo. All right, so I whole, wrote a whole book on that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, that's called Staying Focused in a Hyper World. You know what? I have that on my shelf, and I haven't yeah, read it it's yet. It's a breeze. It goes okay, fast. Okay, all right. I'm going to check it go. out. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I think I got it at uh, one of the last conferences I saw you, and I know it's on my bookshelf at home. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what that's about, and I haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. And, and you know, as you start balancing dopamine, also um, sex becomes much better. Really? Yeah, because you... See, All right, what, what where's happens? that damn book? <laughs> okay. Well, I don't say this in the book because it's for parents, for kids, but oh, I thought okay. you are going to have a mature audience, so I'm sure. going to say it on your show. What happens is what ADD does, one of the major symptoms of it, addiction, any kind of addiction is a form of must have it now. Mm -hmm. uh, like you, a dopamine you, reward behavior? Well, what it is, is what ADD, what they describe as ADD addiction, same thing, is that normal life is boring and something which is high stimulation is more interesting. So the things that would be normally like broccoli would be delicious to a kid unless you gave him desserts. And now that was desserts. me today. I had broccoli and wild salmon. I ate the salmon and threw away the broccoli. All right. Well, the, if the brain is tuned to higher stimulation, lower stimulation, which is natural, doesn't right. doesn't bring as much pleasure. So on one level, on the behavior level, what you have to do is recognize, okay, I like my phone, no big deal, but I have to regulate it. And as much as I have high stimulation, I need to have low stimulation. And the transition to low stimulation is usually boring. There has to be this time where the receptor sites slowly start to open. Lithium speeds up that process. Amino acids speed up that process, make it more efficient. But you still, the supplements won't do it unless you also give yourself the time away from the addiction for the brain to come back. Think of high stimulation like a bright light. Your pupils will constrict. You get high stimulation, a dopamine rush, the dopamine receptors constrict, they disappear. One shot of cocaine, you'll wipe out 30% of your dopamine receptors, which means that your ability to experience pleasure in life has been cut by 30%. And now, Can those, you grow that yes, back? those oh, receptors will come back, and they've proven like, they'll wow. come back. That's what abstinence from an, a, a, an addiction is, abstinence from it. You turn off the bright light, and those pupils will start to open up again. When they start to open up again, there's a period where it's still dark. So that's the boring place. And if it's an intense addiction, then it's a lot of withdrawal symptoms 
but they will open up. Now, the intensity of withdrawal symptoms is dramatically minimized by feeding the body perfectly digested amino acids. Okay, and this is an organic state, not just something made in a laboratory. You got the real food there and the lithium. Lithium is very important for the upregulation of these receptor sites. That's why it works so well. It helps you balance out the extremes. So you withdraw from that. You take your extra supplementation. Then you can go back and spend time there. But you have to have a balance. So one of the symptoms of that addictive tendency is I want it now. So for men, the tendency if I want it now causes them to rush the orgasm. See, the whole secret of great sex is length and quality. I mean, I have to say quality because women are listening. (laughs) Length is a big part of it. And it should always be the focus on making love. Sex is there to increase the love you feel in your heart. And whenever the pleasure is becoming more than the love you feel in your heart, you need to relax and feel the love. Then come back to the pleasure. And then the pleasure will start to dominate. That means the dopamine is going too high. You have to settle it down again and feel the love. The love balances the brain. Okay. Otherwise, we get in that rush and we want to do it really fast. And that doesn't give the woman the time she needs to get into the rush. You know, If she gets what she needs by a good date and various things, she's already warming up. But still, she needs to get to that place where she, the tension is built up and she wants to release. He already has it too quickly if he has ADD type symptoms. So it improves sex too. It makes it easier wow. to, to feel the love and to last longer in sex. Damn. And just one other super idea, okay, because you're such a good audience for me. <laughs> so I love oh, I'm, a, I'm You're just like, listen, you're, probably, you're drinking it up. So let me just no, do No, I love more. it, dude. Okay. I love it. So here's, yeah. here's a dilemma that- I love what of, I do, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Really, so cool. I, yeah. I get it. So do I. We're going to be here all evening. Okay, so this is just one other quickie I, I throw in. The Japanese did a study, and they found that with men, that if they ejaculate on Saturday night- and they don't ejaculate for six days, then on Saturday night, their testosterone levels prior to having sex double. Okay, now this is like a testosterone booster, is not ejaculating for six days. Now you can also have sex during those days as long as you don't ejaculate. And that's, you know, that's learning to do that. But, it, but for couples, often the sexual interest declines because after a man has sex, two days later, generally he'll have sex again. <laughs> Then on Saturday night, he's still going to have mediocre testosterone, the average level. You, it's like if you fast for a day from eating, the next day, what does the food taste like? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You want sex to be amazing, you practice fasting from sex. But really what you're fasting from is ejaculation. So that's a training for men to learn, which is how to be aroused and not always have to release the tension. And the way you do that... It's hard if you've got ADD type symptoms, you want it now, your body just goes for it, grabs for it. So you have to go in these waves like this, and the waves, and, and, and once women start getting excited, they start rushing, they excite you and it's all over. You have to control her, don't give her what she wants right away. That's what men need to have that confidence. You have to regulate the energy here so that you keep, your energy rises in a wave, and then this is Masters and Johnson now. There's arousal and there's breathing. I mean, a lot of people start sex even they're not even doing heavy breathing. Heavy breathing, according to Taoism, is the first orgasm. Just let yourself go into, this is amazing. My breath is taking over. My body's being taken over by these feelings. Just notice that, you know, and then the kissing, you know, and the kissing shouldn't even do anything down south. You can touch around everywhere, but need to have the good tongue action. You know, they talk about that, then the nipple action. And the guy's always rushing, but her whole energy needs to come down to her body. We start down and go up. So we, we, you know, we, we start there, we're all aroused, but we want to bring our energy up to our heart to connect with her as we bring her out of her head down to her heart. So a lot of touching with that whole thing, the kissing. And of course, it works better if you love someone, you know, then you're saying, I love you, and I'm, you know, you're beautiful, I adore you, so, and reasons why you love them, you can say. So a little verbal conversation is always good to slow a man down, okay, get you in your head a little bit so you're not mm. all down south, you know, and... So this is great. Dude. Then you then you're doing a rise. Now the the wave. Okay, Masters and John talked about plateau goes up, and then it flattens. Now flatten doesn't mean it's not pleasurable. It means that it's not increasing pleasure. See arousal is whatever you touch, whatever you do, it feels fantastic. You know, your body says, do it. Then it hits plateau for a certain period of time. For some men, in ten seconds. Other men, two minutes. Whatever. Somewhere in that range, there's plateau. You're just moving along. It's good. Look what I'm doing here. 
and then boom, you have this big ejaculation release. What happened is your nature is your arousal is going up. Now it's time to relax, but you don't relax. So you keep going against the nature, which is to relax. So you build up a tension. That tension then has to be released, and that's ejaculation, which produces massive dopamine, which then becomes an addiction. So ejaculation is actually an addiction. If you go like this, the wave goes up and it goes down, then it comes back up again and it goes down. It goes every time it goes higher. And then you start noticing each one of those little waves is an orgasm without ejaculating. It takes time to build that. And sometimes in the beginning, a few hours. Okay, so you, but, but you start where you can start. You know, if you do too much, you get sore balls. So you got to be careful. <laughs> that means you did too much. Okay, okay. you got greedy. You know, you got yeah, into yeah. trying to get really close to that ejaculation, but not ejaculating. You just go like this, and she'll once you when you go up and down. Sometimes then she'll start to want to pick it up and get you excited because whether women are conscious of it or not, they have power over you, you know? Look what I'm doing to him, you know? And, and they also run for their orgasm when they start to feel they can have one. They'll rush for it, which is the opposite kind of orgasm. Then she has one orgasm, and it's over, as opposed to letting it happen to her, and they'll happen again and again and again at higher and higher levels, you know, till she, you know, is, uh, her body's going crazy, then she'll cling to you, all kinds of spasms happen, and then she has the little death. Oh. You know, I'm dying. You know, that's the, the French would call that. But it takes time to get her to that place, more time today than ever before because women are so over on their male side. They need to come back over to the estrogen side. Woman's estrogen has to double in order for her to have an orgasm. And then it can go even higher and higher. So the wave goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. And it takes his controlling. So if you start to get excited, men, okay, so this is the thing. You try to stop from ejaculating. You're trying to last longer for her because she's all excited. You're going to, you don't need to, don't worry about her at that point. Just slow down. She needs to slow down. If you're overexcited, she needs to slow down, particularly if she's racing. Another thing that causes men to ejaculate too soon is when she's pretending to be aroused. If a woman is pretending to be aroused because and trying to turn you on, but she's not really being turned on, you're doing her. If she's doing you, then your energy can't enter her. Okay, she's got to be receptive. You're doing her receptivity. Your energy goes to her and her response is her orgasmic response to it. And you have this orgasmic energy as well with her. And that's the union as you go higher and higher and higher with this. And this is like, this was known 6,000 years ago. You know, this is Taoism. And they've been hours. Yeah, they didn't have TV. So what did they do? You know? <laughs> no Netflix and <laughs> yeah, chill. No. Just chill. <laughs> they just, they just, they're just uh, under the stars having sex, you know. And, and, but what they found is, is, I guess, what the Japanese found is that you wait that six days. So today, it's very common men's testosterone levels are going down and down and down. Indigenous men never have their testosterone levels go down. Now, I've had my testosterone le levels tested, and it's higher than when I was a young man. And I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or whatever. Somebody got really mad at me the other day when I said my testosterone levels. <laughs> but, but it's because of the sexual practice that your testosterone levels can stay so high. And this whole thing about rising in waves, okay? You, in the beginning, you can only go a few levels up because you haven't been holding your semen long enough. The more you contain semen in your body, the greater capacity your body has to channel more energy. So it has a function in your body. It allows you to receive more and more and more radiance comes out of you because of that. But in sex, these waves, these, these little peaks of pleasure become very orgasmic when you have plenty of semen in your body. And that can take six weeks of making sure you don't release the semen. So you would you know, practice that. But wow. the, the, now the problem for men today is that I wrote another book called Boy Crisis. Okay, boys are, males are having a big challenge today uh, in terms of performance, in terms of confidence, higher levels of suicide, you know, all these problems are happening with guys. And we talk about all the different causes in that book. I'm not gonna go into that, but one of them is masturbating to porn. You're, you're, every time you're doing it, just biologically, you're losing your zinc. Every time you ejaculate, you're using a, a whole full day supply of zinc gone. And zinc is necessary for every neuron in your brain to work. 
So you, you just, you know, three ejaculations in a day and your, your brain's just not going to have full potential, okay? And, and every day like that, you're just depleting yourself of the zinc that your body needs. And you need zinc also to make testosterone. And it also makes every brain cell work. Wow, interesting. Yeah, this is also why boys, prob probably why boys are so much more vulnerable to autism is because they're making testosterone. The first two years in a boy's life to make the male brain, his body makes the testosterone of a grown man. And to make that testosterone, the structure of that brain, he uses up zinc. And if he doesn't get enough zinc, then the neurons can't protect themselves from mercury. And so then the mercury, they become more vulnerable to mercury poisoning. Uh, and girls are less vulnerable to it. And estrogen, estrogen is also protective. After two years old, boys' estrogen levels are almost the same as little girls until they're 13, 12, 13. Then they shift. So much, all that stuff. Wow. But anyway, that's... Damn, uh, that's so But interesting. anyway, the whole thing about conservation yeah. of the testosterone, yeah. the, the, the ejaculate for men is so, so, it's like gold, it's the juice. Um, it's probably why I had such great spiritual experiences in my nine years, I never ejaculated. In my 20s, my teenager was quite busy, <laughs> I like sex, but uh, ironically, after being a monk for nine years, the first seminars I taught were on sex, and people always say, well, how could you do that? I say, if you hadn't had sex in nine years, that's all you think about. And, but what I did is I just got people together and talk about what makes sex great. And how many people have those conversations, you know, particularly back then. So that became the beginning of my whole teaching of workshops was I learned so much. I traveled around, had sex with girls, and I'd say, well, I've been a monk nine years. Will you teach me about your body? And we'd have these long conversations, which would really turn them on as well. <laughs> but today, most people don't do that. But somehow, because oh, I was a monk amazing. and spiritual, they were fine to do it. Right. <laughs> anyway, so much to learn about... Uh, about maintaining that yeah. energy. And when you, what's happening to the younger generation who watch your show is when they masturbate the porn, every time they're losing, little by little, their ability to be turned on to a real woman. Because they get addicted yeah. to the, you get more dopamine with a stranger or a fantasy or online than you could ever get the dopamine stimulation with a real woman. So what happens is you get the high stimulation, the brain goes, oh, cocaine, that's great. Broccoli's boring. Okay, and then, so they can't maintain that interest in their relationship because, you know, they should feel like, I can't wait to get in there, you know, yeah. and they're, they're like over there, I can't wait to go there. I, I totally understand that. Years ago, I had that experience yeah. numerous yeah, occasions. Yeah. yeah, I always recommend to the guy listeners to just, if they are into porn, just quit. I quit a couple of years ago. It changed yeah. my life. Yeah, change your Best life. Thing ever. Just, change, yeah. just, just stay away from it. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, actually, I wanted, I'm going to do a show with an expert just about that because I think it's so important for men to understand. You know? So thank you for leading me into that and reminding me of that part of the mission. All right, man, we're going to get you out of here. Okay. Thanks so much so for cool. joining me, dude. Wow, what a, what a day. Great to so see you. To Great to see you again. <laughs> okay, I'm so glad you. we got to sit down in person. Oh, yeah. yeah Obviously, yeah. we have a lot to talk about. Thank you so much for joining oh, me. Thank you.